Alpha team report. Still nothing. You lost both teams? Get a grip on this operation, Heather. That's bored. Green light, yes, sir. Sir, I need more time. We have no time. Are you going to give that order or not? Sir, please. You are too naive to see the truth. There's no bringing in born. He will defend his police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get the ticket. We force it. But at the end of the day, each and every man is to go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous crime. Nonpartisan liberty for all. I'm your host, Dave Bourne, and it is March 8th, 2017. We had some technical difficulties. I'm not sure what went out and what didn't, but we're restarting the show, and I'm just going to delete the original uh, file there because it looked like, I still can't even tell. It, It looked like only 39 seconds went out, but then it was showing 17 minutes, 39 seconds, but it wasn't playing. So either way... Uh, It wasn't going out live, so we uh, uh, I decided to restart the show, so we might cover, um, I mean, we didn't really get into anything in detail yet, uh, only about 15 minutes, so if we end up repeating something that you heard, it's, uh, it will be very uh, little, because we really didn't get into uh, much. So anyway, thank you for tuning in to nonpartisan liberty for all coming to you live from Las Vegas, Nevada. We're on weeknights, Tuesday through Thursday at six o'clock Pacific, nine o'clock Eastern on the nonpartisan liberty for all media and radio network, which now runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you can listen to the live stream on Spreaker.com and nonpartisan liberty for And to the archives immediately following the show and, of course, all the old archives Anytime uh, on Spreaker, YouTube, Twitter, Tumblr, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes. And (laughs) on Nonpartisan Liberty for All, we promote self-ownership. And I'm trying to do two things at once. (laughs) We promote self-ownership and the ideas of true freedom and liberty, meaning being able to do whatever you want as long as you respect the freedom of others. And, oh, I'm getting pictures there. Respect the freedom of others and don't directly interfere with their freedom, exposing government for what it is, a mafia based on extortion that rules without consent by threat of force and violence. We are always happy to hear from you, and you can reach us by phone at 702-470-7664. That's 702-470-7664, or via Skype at Nonpartisan Liberty for All. Uh, check us out at nonpartisanlibertyforall.com, which gives you links to all our social media pages, as well as original articles and all of our contact information, including the number and the Skype username, if you uh, have forgotten that. And he hasn't been on our show for a while. Um, (laughs) I feel like I'm repeating myself because I am uh, because we've been off uh, for a while. But uh, Ken Shorjan, who joins us every other Wednesday to talk about the economy and geopolitics, is uh, back uh, with us. And thanks, Ken, for joining us as always. Yep, Dave. Pleasure to be here as always. And Looking that was forward to it. Fun to uh, go through that again. 
<laughs> yeah, well, we might as well start on After what we were talking about, uh, International Women's time. Day. Right. So, yeah, uh, we talk, I just mentioned UNLV and the uh, ba- basketball uh, NCAA tournament and whatever. And But, yeah, and we started talking about um, International Women Women's Day, which, you know, it was fucked up was they have, like, a, a TV up. It's... It, I don't want to say too much about my work. We'll just say there's a break room and there's a TV up. And that, that's how where I saw it. It said it mentioned International Women's Day. So we we talked about uh, that a little. And you had mentioned the uh, the rally uh, on during the inaugural weekend, which, you know, was partially a prompt. Trump, Trump protests and, and uh, you know, a woman's rally. I don't know. I feel like it's, you know, 1960 or something. Um, but we started talking about something we talked about before and what's going on in Japan where they people just don't want to have sex. People don't want to partner up anymore and how that affects the family. Um, and you had brought up the MGTOW movement, which I just became aware of uh, a couple months ago. I don't know. I saw it on YouTube or something, which means uh, – what does it mean again? Yeah, there's a growing there's a growing movement. It's, it's an acronym. Right. I'll, not just in Japan, but in the U.S. and right. Europe. Um, and there's some really juicy information we got uh, coming up, but – since the since the feminism really started in the 1920s or 1910s, the suffrage movement, right, which was which was real, you know, fe- I mean that was about real rights. I mean the right to vote and women actually having equal uh, rights. I mean not how things are now. Exactly, so, that, it's just like back then. You know, unions were necessary for the worker. Because the uh, during the Gilded Age, the robber barons, they had all the politicians in their pocket, and they were pretty much just, uh, you know, utilizing human labor until it, uh, you know, burned out and then throw it away and get some more. And that's why those type of laws were needed. But over time, as we got to the 60s, the feminist movement that started in the 60s um, really sp- spawned out of the um world war ii when a lot of women had to leave the home and go to work in the factories to support the war while the men were fighting and they got a taste of that freedom away from the traditional roles and in the uh thing and after during eisenhower when eisenhower you know became president he was a stickler of tradition and women were back into the leave it to beaver and and uh brady bunch type roles see and And that led that led that generation the baby boomer generation the young young women right to rebel and started the feminist movement but okay see, I, I i'm not against that neither um I, i'm no. against, against the bullshit that they're doing now but as far as if a woman wants to work um you know and all, and and having the at least um laws that don't stop you from doing certain things that you can do what you want um, you know, that's up to them, but it, that's not what's going on right now. This is well, no, hold on, hold on. We need to have the Go preparation ahead. because there, because it's what happened in the seventies that is really led to what's going on today. And right. I'll tell you why. Okay. Um, when women moved out of, uh, you know, into the, the feminism, we of course had Roe v. Wade It gave women an out to, uh, if they had unwanted children, or an unwanted pregnancy, they had the reproduction choice to get rid of that. Right, and I support men no longer had a say. So, in a in case of a marriage, you know, the men no longer had a say in this. Even Nor should they, in my opinion. But that's, that's fine. Yeah. But we have had between fifty and sixty uh, million um, children that have been aborted since nineteen seventy two. What this has done is is we now have a lack of uh, of workers to be able to support this massive benefits uh, system with all the baby boomers now going into uh, Social Security, Medicare, etc. Um, now, that's just one side of the coin. The second side of the coin is, is in, the, in the late 60s, we had the no-fault divorce. 
That means anybody could get uh, divorced for any reason at any time. As they, they I mean, another thing, as they should be, if you uh, want to get divorced, I mean, Look, the, we're, we're you not talking to get divorced, but, but I'm ahead. not talking about the moral ramifications. Right, right. You're about, just talking about, about what economic. led to what. You're right. And uh, so we also had the, the instance where men started, the court started virtually in every single instance, uh, men lost out. Okay, women got the kids. Men had to pay child. Yeah, they, I mean that's a they, yeah that's a different issue. Men get screwed when it comes to that. But no, yeah. it's not a different issue. It's it's a it's all tied into the same thing. Um, secondly, well, to me, if whether you want to get divorced or not, as opposed to what happens in the divorce, it is a different issue because it, men get changes, men get screwed. Well, the reason is is because every civilization, the absolute basic foundation of any civilization is the family. Okay. Any nation that has created, has destroyed the family, that civilization has gone from the earth. Okay. We, we used to have nomads who were clan, you know, clans, whether it was in Scotland, whether it was the Arabs in the, in the hijab, it doesn't matter. Everything was based on family and, and um, you know, even in the farms, the family stayed in one place, they worked, they, they all supported that nuclear thing. The second thing about the women going in mass into the workforce is it suddenly took away a lot of jobs, paying good paying jobs that men used to have to be able to support a family. Well, a lot of that too, I mean, if, if you look at, you know, inflation and stuff like that. And we talked about how it, at one point you could one, you could have a family where one person worked. You exactly. can't even have that if you want that anymore. That's, that's no. a fucking issue. By, by putting more people in the labor force, uh, generating more money, you instantly have to print more money, especially in this free currency system to be able to support the expansion of growth. And that's what well, the, uh, the central bank has done. Right. If we didn't have a, a system that was run by a central bank where they're printing money that's not backed by anything, um, right. you know, then... Now, that's one side. Right. The, the second side is o over time, okay? Um, the fact of the matter is, is since 2008, more there are now more women in the workforce than men. When all these layoffs took place in 2008, the vast majority, because a lot of the positions that were lost were in construction, were in more uh, rigorous industrial manufacturing, which had predominantly men, the, uh, the banking, the medical, which, and ed medical and education, which is predominantly women, those all expanded over the past 10 years. And so women, pretty much, there are more women working than men. So that right there takes takes away any incentive of men to get married and have a family because their traditional intrinsic uh, role of, uh, of providing is no longer there. Secondly, um, as I said with the courts, uh, setting the, the law is pretty much in favor of women in almost 85 to 90 percent of the cases. Uh 60% of all marriages now end in divorce, period. 70% are uh, triggered by women. So the men have been asking the question, what benefit at all is it for me to get married? And and uh, from this has risen in the West a movement called MGTOW, men going their own way. Well, that, that's more than getting married. That's not even having a committed relationship. That's just going right. around. This, this is that's this just is, going around fucking everybody. <laughs> yeah, but that's not the the purpose behind it. The purpose behind it is men no longer have well, in this right, society. Right. I understand no, hold on. the reason why they no longer have the the traditional role in society to provide yeah. and take care of a family. So if they don't, then they are spending all their money, their resources, and their time focusing on themselves okay and because women also no longer have to follow the traditional role of getting married in their 20s and etc cetera, etc cetera, women have this freedom that during that time they just sleep around with anybody move from one partner or another it's called monkey branching well that is a person's right 
but well, no, we're not talking right here. I know. We're, to, I we're know. talking. You're talking we're about talking how how it got to how it is choices, right? And so what has ended up happening is is that women now have not wanted to have children until their middle 30s to 40s, and they're finding that uh, the the six they're also because there's an there's an instinctive thing in society, and this is absolutely true almost 100% of the time. Men marry economically down, okay? Women marry economically up. Well, if women are now all of a sudden making all the money, they're in the executive positions, they're, they're doing this successful career, the amount of men that actually make more money or are higher in the food chain is much, much less. We're talking 5 to 10%. Well, guess what? Those 5, 10% aren't going to be interested in 30 and 40-year-olds when they can go after 20-year-olds to get married. And the reproductive age for women is at its best between like 25 and 30, 31. When you're in your middle 30s to 40s, it's much harder. That's why the, that's why fertility clinics and all that have, have sprouted up. Well, it's actually younger than that, than 25. It's... That's a prime rate. I mean, obviously, sixteen is whatever, but um, you know, it's but, a, it, as far as the uh, the other end of it, right? Right. So, what is it? I think it's like thirty five. Is because though. women have have focused on the career, and if you take a look in the universities, uh, the um, the ratio of women There's to more, men in right. school is now There's sixty women. forty. Sixty forty. Okay, so. Men men aren't uh, aren't aren't being able to provide. They're not interested in uh, in marriage because of the economic standpoint. So what does that do? Now all of a sudden we have a decline in birth rate, and the decline in birth rate has actually started in the United States since 1972, aka when the feminist movement really hit hit stride. Right now we are at 1.85 uh, births per woman, and you need 2.1 to sustain a population as it is. So this trend is going so much, not just in Japan, which has, is – they have more people in their retiring elderly um, generation than they do in the millennial generation, in the young generation. That's how bad it is. But now you also – one, one of the other things, though, is you had people having – people that had kids – had a lot more kids. If you look at the baby boomer generation, a lot of them, I mean, both my parents had four kid families. You don't see a lot of even people that have kids having more than like two kids. Well, it's two, it's and, two and things. It's, it, one, of, it, one of the reasons for that, though, is financially, you can't afford to have four, four kids. Exactly. Part of it's financial because the devaluation of the dollar has gotten so bad. Right. Secondly is... The, the more higher up you go on the success ladder, the more hours in that you are dedicated towards your job. Well, yeah, and the other thing is you can't – you cannot raise four kids if both parents are working. You just uh, – no. you can't – well, they, they, they think they can by putting them all in, ch- in child care and then – Yeah, but that's not really raising your kids. State to, well, yeah, but that's the mentality. Right. See, we are in a selfish mentality. Okay. Well, usually uh, the people that have four kids are on welfare and they're sitting at home. So the, uh, the baby, the baby boomer generation uh, was not necessarily the me generation, the self gratification, but it was the rebellion against the tradition. Um, then the 1980s generation X was the Wall Street generation. Greed is good. Uh, try to get as much money as possible, and then. Generation X is definitely the me, self-gratification, safe spaces, snowflake, et cetera. It's interesting, the generation that's coming up now, that's like the the true millennials who are about 14, 15, 16 years old right now, they are actually more towards the old traditional ways. See, Most I, of them are conservative. I, Most I of them are not activists, and they are paying attention to not the indoctrinations that the uh, that the mainstream gives them. I thought they, they're not even millennials because I thought, uh, I mean, millennials, more, yeah, I mean, this, we're, we're, it's got to cut off somewhere. So I guess they're the the end of the millennials then because exactly. the millennials the supposedly are like what, like 1982 or something? No, um, Gen, uh, yeah, Gen X is 60, about 67, 68 to 
82, the uh, what they call millennials, because their 18 year range went from 82 to 2000. Yeah, they, the one that's about it, one to 2000 to 2016, 17 right now. So that's yeah. It's it's like twenty year almost, and and I don't understand how they come up with because they, there's a big difference between if if you're looking at Generation X between the end of Generation X and the beginning, there's a huge I don't know I I don't know right. how you can lump them together like that, but whatever. But if anything, you're looking at the end of the millennials because people in their early 30s are considered millennials. You know, people 30, 31 are millennials. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and who knows uh, what the uh, psychologists, you know, throw this out. But here's the other thing is you think it's bad in the United States or in Japan. In Europe, it is on is desperation. In Spain, for example, they have passed – Political correctness has pa- has gone to the point that women can accuse a man of rape or domestic violence without evidence, and 95% of the time the men are arrested and thrown in jail without even being able to do a defense. Political correctness has destroyed any any rights men have in any relationship. Thus, over the past 10 years, men have just reached refrained from sex from marriage from everything i mean it, it well the, i mean the political you're correctness gonna have of robots the courts. pretty soon too so well, um, yeah. that are going to be able to do all of that so that's that's going to affect it even more because people are going to say you know those same people um once they have lifelike robots are going to be like totally fuck it because they can get, <laughs> i guess in in the cut and in, in in a couple ways uh literally um because they're gonna get these robots and they're gonna be like what the fuck i need a girl for i can that's, i can program and, this and robot that's that's i can fuck really, them and you know yeah go ahead well here's the thing about spain okay spain the the the, the nut job liberals who run spain and most of the europe now they are trying to figure out why they don't want to be responsible for the re- real reasons behind it. They want to figure out why men just don't want to have marriage and they don't want to have sex. So in Spain, the government has taken a radical step to arrest the country's declining birth rate by creating the position of a sex czar. That's nice. It's part, it's part of a bid to encourage a baby boom and counteract a population slump. So without – Taking any, you know, politicians who have no idea what's really going on with anything, you know, p- let's pass the bill before we have a chance to look at it, you know, Pelosi type thing. This is the problem is that this political correctness and this this uh, rise of feminism and this degrading of men in society has led to the point where men don't want sex, don't want marriage, and the government never even bothers to see the the fundamentals behind this. So instead, they're going to like do uh, posters and and ad campaigns to try to get people to have sex, and men aren't buying it. Something else that's, that's happening. It's something that the government should be involved in. Period. Oh yes, it should. Uh, because I, I, I don't. Well, I don't believe the government should fucking exist. Lose. So, uh, but, well, yeah. Uh, um, no, they they, they should they shouldn't be governing. And first of all, I, I don't think when it comes to morals and morality and things like that that the government has any business being in that. Now it's their fault because of. You know, you you went over some of the reasons, but it, there's things like the financial aspect and the financial side of that. And a lot of it is a, a lot of the laws, you know, whether it's the uh, welfare and inflation and all of these things. So never mind even uh, people wanting to work, because I think that's obviously their right. But when it comes to all of these uh, regulations and uh, central banks and all of, of that type of stuff uh, and welfare and women not wanting to, uh, you know, get married because they're going to lose part of their welfare money and shit like that. So, you yeah, know, and here's two other stats in Great Britain. As of two years ago, more children are born to single mothers out of wedlock than to married couples. 
in the African American communities all across the United States, on average, seventy nine percent of children are born out of wedlock. Right. It's it's the high, need it's for a man. The 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 mentality of the need for a man in any marriage that is is moot. It's none. It's gone. It's it's this indoctrination plus the fact that the well, government got involved again, with taking care of again. That, the, that's that's the thing. They shouldn't be involved. Period. Either way, and now, of course, again, I don't believe that they should be involved in anything. I don't think they should fucking exist. But either way, that's not something they they shouldn't be involved. Period. Because they You're right. they've gotten involved. They, they got involved and started in, it in so and... many different ways. They got involved from indoctrination as well, um, like with political correctness. Now, so they've got in a, they got involved on so many different levels. If they totally left it alone and, you know, some women went to work and some women didn't and things would work themselves out. But they passed, you know, different regulations. They tried to influence uh, through indoctrination. They tried to influence people. You know, they did all of these things instead of just staying out of fucking people's business. And if women want to work, they want to work. And if they don't, they don't. And if people want to get married, they, they get married. And if they want to have kids, they have kids. Now, I understand your point that they're looking out, I guess, and it just kind of just even saying this just bothers me, but for the best interest of their uh, country, I guess you would say uh, continuity of government, because if you don't have if you don't have a population to rule and control, then I guess, you know, you don't have a country. Yeah, but it's not so, just it's not just the government. Um, there was a uh, T-shirt created in Florida back in 2003 with the subject of a campaign against um Violence against children, okay? But really it was about violence by children against other children. The The T-shirt said, boys are stupid, throw rocks at them. And guess what? That later became a book, and that book is now part of the curriculum of 23% of right, all but schools. Where do you think – and there you go, and who controls the schools? Where the do you think these things the are coming NEA, from? Who controls the media? I mean, all of these things is what the, in my opinion, I call them the powers that be, is what they want to happen. So it it's not like somebody had the idea um, and they did it all on their own. You know what I mean? It's it's all goes back to indoctrination by media by government by all of these things is, is what i'm saying it's a change in the culture the government gets involved in the culture whether people want to recognize it or not and they definitely do through the media because i mean and, but, but in reality but in reality the government is simply a tool that people humans use okay um the obama the obama administration uh, thing Obama was uh, was indoctrinated by what is known as the Clive Clive Pivens movement, and the Clive Pivens they were two university professors. It's it's who, it's not Clive P Pivens, it's uh, Cloward and Piven. Cloward Pivens, okay. Um, they wrote they were two university professors who wrote a book that the way to bring about communism is to saturate the welfare system so great that you destroy the economic system, and one of their leading um sycophants was barack obama and sure enough look what he did he doubled the national debt he pretty much uh you know destroyed any type of economic growth and made everything this one big welfare state and tax state and healthcare state and uh look at our economy now now he's not the only one okay and both sides of the thing did it but it's not just the government is simply a tool for humans who, to uh engross their agendas well, or their, course, their I, desires I, on others i disagree it's humans but it's it's the elite it's not it, the well, government that's, that's is humans. not the, the people humans. the government is not the average person the government is yes they're humans well unless you want to believe the whole fucking no. lizard conspiracy no, but, but, but um things have been throughout it's, all it's of the elite it, the that, rich, it's the always elite. been the elite. It's not. Exactly. It's not regular people, right? And the vast it's not majority me and of those you. who are elite 
or psychopaths who would love to see the world burn or sociopaths but same yeah. thing they, yeah they have well, no emotion they have no conscience they have no no moral compass right, so so and well, they need extremes to feel any type of feelings and so that's why they go you know they well, th- that's this is why the pedophilia thing is getting to be really big. And well, that's, that, gonna- that's why I'm saying that it's not, you know, and you say it's the the people and what humans want. It, it it's not. It's 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 yes, it is the what the elite want and what well, happens the is they're yeah, but, people. but they are, but 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 they're not when, robots. when they're you not, look at it, okay, they are people. Fine, they are people. However. They're a very small percentage of the population, first of all. And you got to look at the fact that take a kid today. Never mind, you know, when you grew up and when I grew up, and you're not that much older than me where things were that different, you know. Um, not that I want to say how old I am. But, you know, like, yeah. it's no, we, we didn't grow up in, like, totally different generations. It was a little different, but not a lot. So... Look at kids now, and it was bad enough back then, but look at kids now and how indoctrinated they are. Sure. You know, and and you go from school, media, your parents are most likely indoctrinated. It's like you're indoctrinated from birth, so it's hard to break out of that. I mean, it's like you don't have a chance from the beginning. And, you and, and, do unless, if you have two parents who are interested. Well, if in you have your, somebody like me, and you're being raised. If like somebody that's going to raise their kid uh, to think for themselves and not indoctrinate them and homeschool them and all of that stuff. Yes, but there's how many people are like that? There's not a lot. That's what I'm saying. Is I think there's a growing amount of people. But on the other side, there's a growing amount, too. The ignorance is growing. And, right, and, but- and people are not evil. They are not bad. The majority of people are not evil. They are not bad. They are just ignorant. And they've been brought up. And they're apathetic. To They're apathetic. They're willing to be sheep, whether it's, but it's they don't congregations in the church. It. That, then that's saying that humans have no choice. That no, no, they, such they thing do. As free will. They do. I, I'm not. I, I'm not put it, saying that they're totally irresponsible for their actions because that would be like you know saying the police are not responsible for the shit that they do. They're totally responsible. What I'm saying, and criminals though, are responsible for robbing places and raping people. Right, and they should they, be arrested. And they, and they and are. It, well, well, but, but, but that's more obvious that it's wrong. Right. Um, there's certain things that it, it's it's more obvious that this is wrong compared to, um, you know, when I look at the government, they everything's based on force and everything right. they but do if, is know, wrong. If, if the but, people that were if the people that were all these activists, if they went before city council with pitchforks and, and torches and didn't do this, uh, you know, and took their real grievances and made. You know the the politicians. Fuck that. They, they need guns. Rather, rather than taking bullshit things like a women's day and go marching. Oh yeah, no, it's whatever, ridiculous. And they dedicated their time towards real change. You know, in in the places at the local levels that could change, it would change. But, but they those don't. people aren't even half of them. Maybe not half, but the people leading them are, uh, you know. Uh, political operatives yeah i mean exactly. so and the people machine. leading them and so the, the people that are following them yeah are ignorant and they are responsible for their actions but what i'm saying is it's harder it's getting harder and harder to break out of this uh brainwashing and this indoctrination because it's coming at you from everywhere yeah the movies and television it's, it's shows just it, everything your school, your it's government, everything your media your faith it's but totally you know honestly, programmed so but I, honestly I, it's breaking out we didn't have this this rising extent. populist movement okay i, now, I don't people, agree, the, well, i disagree with what you know the look, whole the, the 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 end result may what it is is the people know something's wrong but they can't put their finger on it and so they're reactionary in that brexit the, the rise of Marine Le Pen in France, right wing. The rise of uh, Syriza when, when they took over Greece. The rise of Geert Wilder, who has been arrested three times for hate crimes for blaming the uh, 
uh, for blaming the um, uh, the Islamic refugees for the crimes that they commit. He's been arrested three times for hate speech. He's he's about to become their new president. Okay, uh, the well, rise of Donald Trump. Fine, but you're not going to change a bit. Just, out of nowhere. And I, you know, I, I I agree with you on one point that. They know something's wrong. They're, Ron they, Paul revolution. The well, that's that, that's Rick actually Trump. something with Ron Paul say, that this, that I would say the people were know that something's wrong. They just don't know how to deal with it, and so they go out and they try to affect. It's not change. through the system. You're not going to change the system through the system. I'm sorry, no, but, and you've and you've but, said but, that Neil, before as well. Just remember what Tip O'Neill said. All what, what politics. Did Tip say? All politics is local. You're not going to change Washington. You're not going to change, you change local, your yeah. local. And look what's happened in New Hampshire, the the free free state movement. That's it's, brought uh, a lot of change. Maybe not as much. Not as, as, as much local. as they they uh, act like it has. Right, but it's done. I mean, they, some they don't they don't even have legalized marijuana there. That got defeated, I believe. Okay. <laughs> well, what I'm but, saying uh, is, if it's so free, I mean, in Nevada, we have legalized marijuana now. Right. You know, there's if but if the people ha- wanted it, the people wanted it in a referendum and it was passed. The government didn't make the change. The people did because somebody somewhere uh, got enough information out and they put it on the ballot and they got enough people to sign the petition to do it. Um, we yeah, all but, but they can control uh, those. Uh, they can control those, too, because it, it, check this out. They, they also passed and the people didn't want this. It barely passed. Um, that universal background checks was on the ballot in Nevada, and it passed. You know why it passed? Because fucking Bloomberg put fourteen million dollars into the campaign uh, to uh, to to get that passed against four million dollars. Right on but the other side, on and TV. it still passed many, by point. How many went went you, door to door. But, how many but, people but hold on, I, I don't know. But it still it still passed by like point forty of a point. You know, it was like fifty point uh, four five to forty nine. You know, uh, fifty five or something. It was it was like that close. Right. So well, then the market. Yeah, well, and, and they had eighteen time? million altogether because they had fourteen well, million from Bloomberg. You have somebody bring it up again, and you know what? If Bloomberg wants to keep putting his money out there, I doubt if he's going to do it year See, after year that, after year. That's the problem. That, that's the thing that 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 you're you're leaving out though. That when you say all politics is local, it's not anymore. Because for Clark County, I'll tell you right now, and and looking at their budget and all the money they get from the federal government. And how, and you know this, that what they'll do is they'll they'll set up whatever um, and put money into these states, and groups that that have nothing to do with that state will come in and fund candidates. The parties will do it. They'll have super PACs and whatever that will will set up and try to control what goes on in that state, even though they're not from that state or those well, group of people yeah, aren't but from here's, that state. Here's the other side of the coin. Okay, you're using Clark County. Clark County is a very it's, unique it's in situation. Huge. Harry Reid, the yeah. only reason Harry Reid lasted so long is because... Well, Harry Reid was, was a senator. He, he was he a bought, was, yeah, but he was a bought and paid for tool of the casinos. Well, he's been... You, you know that he he's a career politician and right. that he was on the Clark County Commission. If you saw the movie Casino... That character was based on um, him, the right. state senator who was also the head of the gaming commission. So he's a career politician. He's been in politics since his late twenties, uh, at least thirty. So it, th- that's a different story. I'm not even talking about Harry Reid. I'm talking about we're right. in a take a look at Adelson, Adelson and uh, Steve. Wynn. Right, he puts a lot they of money were into big stuff. Big into putting money in the political things. But the, but I'm not even talking about them. What I'm telling you is that the federal government is giving all these grants. It, states don't fund themselves anymore. It, it's it, the money that goes to the federal government is distributed to the states. The way one of the ways that the federal government controls the states is they say we're not going to give you money how do you think they got all these states to adopt common core 
because they gave oh, the agree. money for education. I agree. So Look, I agree that's that, that's it, where it's it's this, not as easy as as you think. You know, if you're, if you're talking about thing. a really small town. But here's you know, an interesting maybe. thing. Okay, um, not saying that the conservatives are the correct choice, but. With the elections, what ended up happening is not only did uh, did the Republicans get the House, Senate, and uh, White House, but they also now have 34 of the 50 states. They they have or 33 of the 50 states. All they need is 34 to call a uh, constitutional convention. At 38, all it takes is 38 states to ratify an amendment. Now, every single amendment that has been added to the Constitution has all come from Congress, and the state simply ratified it. If the states decide that they want to change Washington, they can get together and Congress will have no say. Zero. The states can change the Constitution, remove amendments. The first thing they need to do is they need to put in a term limit. They need to remove direct election of senators. They need to remove the income tax. They need to do a lot of these things, okay? And the states are very close to having enough one-sided, a.k.a. conservatives or Republicans, to do this. And the Democrats and liberals and progressives will have no say at all. That is significant. And this is rising because the state of Tennessee just passed a bill in their legislature waiting signature to put forward to all the governors to call for a constitutional convention. You know when the last constitutional convention was? 1789, when they went from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution. It's never been done in 253 years since then. Great. Then you'll have uh, Republicans who will add a a bunch of... uh you know, repressive fucking amendments. Either way, whichever party you go to, they're, they're taking away freedoms. You're well, getting uh, fucked yeah. either way. It doesn't I, that's matter. That's why I said it My, doesn't necessarily mean that conservative does, Republican is right. No. I'm saying I, is, I, I, I is don't that want there a is ruler. It, it is my point. If you want to I, I don't want Washington, people ruling over me. Level. No, I don't want a ruler. I don't want somebody ruling over me. I, you well, know, I, 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 I hundred and twenty nine having nine, somebody nine tell me that, that they own my body and I can't put what I want in my body because they own it as far as they're concerned and they own everybody as far as they're concerned. I do not care if everybody in Congress is great. And they're the best people. It doesn't matter. The problem with government is you could write the best. And obviously, this happened. It failed. If if you believe the Constitution stood for freedom, uh, which I don't, if you actually believe that. Now, the, the Ninth Amendment really got screwed because the way I interpret the ninth amendment is actually that you can do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anybody because the ninth amendment says just because we didn't say you can't do this doesn't mean you can't do it. The problem is, is once you give somebody power over you, you're giving them uh, the power to do things that you can't do. And you're you're turning that over to them, and they're well, going to take of, more and more power. It doesn't matter what you start 18, with. In 1860, a group of states thought they could do the same thing, and because they saw the creeping rise of federalism, where the gov- cent, uh, central government was taking power away yeah, from the states, yeah, but they they still, and they tried to rebel. Well, that's against the federal government. Kicked. It's still a state that was run by rulers. So that's well, not the same thing. Well, yeah, but let, let's get out of fantasy land. Where we're it's not, not have fantasy colors. land. It's, it's Show it's, me it's, a government in the history of the world that's never had a dominating governor. Never. Never in the history of the world. Even if it's a small clan, there is still a clan chief. That doesn't there, mean it, that, it, that, it, that it's right because – you cannot deny no, the impossible. fact. Okay, look. Human human You beings cannot deny cannot... the fact. Hold on. You cannot deny the fact, right? This is a fact that government is based on the threat of violence. It's government bottom line. Is based on the th- government, government is, is based on the threat government of violence. Well, yeah, but all government is it comes from the barrel of a gun. Yeah, the exactly. Is, who has the fortitude 
to point government the gun. has no the real people. authority but hold on government has no real authority even washington said according to now this is according to larkin rose uh i didn't actually look up the quote but i i take his word for it because i'm i know he's well researched I don't remember the exact words, but it was something to the effect, and he named a bunch of people. Washington said that the people should have this, the amount of arms that the government has. Because if you want a checks, not checks and balances, but a, uh, what do you call it? Well, actually, yeah, if you checks and balances, really. Because basically, nothing, there are no checks and balances because it's all government. So government can do what it wants, and you can't stop them. The people don't have any power because government comes from the barrel of a gun. So unless you have a gun to match that gun, you cannot stop the government from infringing on your freedom. But we do. We have the Second Amendment. It's just a piece of paper. Really? We, we, we do. To an yeah. extent, no. Where does it gun, say? Gun. Where does it say in the Second Amendment that you need a background check and you can't be convicted but, of a felony? But but where? But if if a government? But, but that that's what the law is, though. Yeah, you know why? Because enough. It doesn't people, matter why. I'm just saying. Where does it why, say that? Look, if if your local government, your state government, the federal government does something that you don't like, every. Two to four years, you That's have the right the to biggest throw them out of office. That I've ever heard, and you can throw them out of office. Yes, but I need everybody else to throw them out of office. Uh, I, I uh, can't uh, fire uh, them myself. If I don't uh, want just, them over me, I cannot fire them. But see, I need that's, you that's and a bunch of not you personally, but a bunch of other people to fire them too. Why can't I fire them? Because I don't want them. No, I can't do that. Because They're forced does on not work me. Tell, tell me this: if, if, if there was a movement, a freedom movement, okay, are there, a bunch of people just going to radically, radically, individually do their own thing and achieve a goal? No, you're always going to have a leader of a revolution. Yeah, right. You're going to have a leader but, of a movement. But you get to that choose. Is a leader. If you want to be a, a part of that, it, no. But you get to choose whether you want to be a part of that movement or not. You oh, yeah. get. You get to and see. That's my problem. Is consent, the, and, and that's why you know they call it a voluntarist, where you you enter into contracts because you want to. There is no contract with the government. I was just born here. I can't go anywhere because governments have taken over the whole world. I don't have any say. I cannot get anything done. If I want to get something changed, I cannot get something changed, okay? And right. and, 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 and you have to. it's we live in an oligarchy and you know that because right. you, again, you know all all of these things as well. Um and in the fact that and you've even said this before that we've gone too far. Now I know you're talking to to be able to change things through the system. Now you're you're talking about local stuff, so I know you know you differentiate that. But yeah, I mean, the problem is is that one you cannot stop the government. So if they wanted to, uh, and they've slowly taken away certain things within the Second Amendment. I mean, they have a gun registry. Did you know that? That yeah. people uh, Adam Kokesh is in a gun registry, like like right. a like a child molester registry, right? And um, he made he made a choice. He decided to challenge the federal government by taking yeah, a gun what he did to Washington was, D.C. and brandishing it near the White House. Yeah, and he had the right to choice. do that. And, but but as far as I'm concerned, he, there, there's a difference between have consequences, laws, and rights. And the government, just because something is a law, doesn't mean they have the right to make that law they don't the only thing that gives them the the power and the ability to make that law is that you cannot stop them because they have a bunch of men with guns you're right there, and here's, are, there but, are here's, but here's the point the, there is no difference between government which is a tool and a gun which is a tool right etc cetera, etc cetera. either one hand put in the hands of men will be used for whatever purpose the man who's handling either chooses, okay? The thing about it is, is for you and I, But okay, that doesn't, that has nothing to do with go, my point. For you and I go to politics, 
There's a reason why good moral people, even ones who want freedom, don't go into politics. Because politics is nasty, it's a waste dirty, of fucking it's time. vile, and it destroys lives. Okay? Politics. Well, that's not the, term, that's not the only reason. The I don't want to rule over other people. I don't want to be their but ruler. If you go into po- well, hold plenty. on. If you go into politics, by definition, you believe you know what's best for people in certain areas, and you want to rule over them. Now, you you can you can deny that or say it in a different way. But what do people do when they campaign? They say, True. I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do, you know what I mean? But, so they're saying sort of, that my plan is the best a, and I want to force thing, you something on you. yourself. Okay. You're saying that people are not evil, whatever. You know what? Those who seek power. Okay. No, that means I said the majority are not others. evil. I, I didn't say people are, they, they don't twist, twist words there. Right. I said the majority of people are not evil now remember but but, but, but hold on remember we have 320 million people in this country if five percent of the people are evil i mean that's that's fucking what uh about 15 million and if 95 I mean, that's a lot of people sheep who just want to live their lives and not worry about things and they're willing to suffer uh, a little bit here, a little bit there, like a boiling frog. Guess what? But that doesn't in make almost them a every bad instance, person. Ninety-five percent of all people, in whatever capacity, whether it's congregation in a church, whether it's uh, students in a school, whether it's whatever, ninety-five percent of the people are just docile, apathetic sheep, and they're right, easily manipulated. Right, but it doesn't, it doesn't make them a bad person. They, wait, power. wait, wait, hold on, hold on, because we're talking over each other. Um, but that doesn't make them a bad person. It just makes them ignorant. No, 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 no. I'm not saying bad. Okay, what I'm saying is is it, okay. Here's here's a question. I, 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 I know. I, I agree with you. To here's an here's a legitimate question. Okay, go ahead. If um, if you you had a family and you were homeless, and you had no money and you had no hope or future, whatever, would you? Continue to seek out ways to do it legitimately, or would you go down and, and steal if you had? Oh to? no, I mean the way I. But, but you got to talk about you don't you, you don't know about Situ- a lot about my past. So okay, situations <laughs> in life. Situations. I sell drugs. <laughs> okay, I've I, I sold drugs when that, I was in high school, and and, and, I, and, and, and that should that's, be legal. So I don't even think that's I'm bad. It's morally wrong or morally right. What I'm saying is, and 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 you know what. Would I good, rob somebody good, at gunpoint? Bad and wrong is a moral judgment for the most part. Um, the the fact of the matter is is that government to you you is absolutely immoral and every they single are, aspect of but, the, I, I, I'm agreeing with you. I'm agreeing with you. Hold on okay. a second. Every right. single aspect is immoral to you, but for the vast majority of the people who are worried about safety, security, right. and they don't have the fortitude themselves to take care of their own safety and security right. and are deeming it to a uh, public official or a politician or a government to, to do it for them, okay, that's the thing about it is, is it's not necessarily that people have to be evil. It's just they're apathetic and they either won't or can't do the things necessary for absolute freedom – to take care of themselves. Well, you know, a lot of the that wild West, in the Wild West, we had before before the the territories became states. Okay, you right. had a roaming roaming uh, marshal every once in a while. You had a sheriff in a town who would maybe call a posse from some good people, but for the very most part, it was as close to anarchy as you could get. And you know what? The blood ran for miles when for, people but, did not have any type of lawful. Uh, well, Mandy, or right. Direction. But but again, there's the difference between, uh, you know, still having like the group that I talked about, Dale Brown, his uh, the Detroit Threat Management Center, which is a private. He doesn't even like to be called security. Um, he has a word for it, but they protect people and keep them safe. Right. So, you know, right now. Obviously, you have a police force that has a monopoly on force. And right. as opposed to, okay, they know you can't fire them. I mean, individual cops can get fired. 
But you cannot say, okay, you guys treat everyone like shit. Your customer service sucks. I want to go hire somebody else to protect me. Plus, they don't protect you anyway. Uh, They get there after the crime has been committed. Maybe they catch the person. Maybe they don't. It depends what the crime is. Usually, if your house is broken into, you can forget about it. Um, Unless you're somebody that's pretty important. But the point being that, one, I'm not saying there is any utopia. There is not. It just it doesn't exist. There is no, you know, utopia, whether it's, uh, you know, anarchy or and I don't even like the word anarchy because you have a lot of people that are more socialist that want anarchy. So I, I just say that I, I believe in, you know, you should be able to do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anybody else. But there are other ways that are voluntary to handle things that entering into agreements and i don't have all the answers and and neither did the founding fathers didn't have all the answers neither i mean they wrote one document that isn't even really that long and that was part of the point yeah exactly and you know that that was that was the thing is is the the reason the bill of rights came in there is because most of the states still want to do the articles fit confederation and if you take a look at it it's kind of interesting because most of the states were founded by different segments of the population pennsylvania by the german immigrants um William new york Penn. was mostly dutch slash yeah it used to be British. controlled by the dutch uh, initially it was uh yeah, new amsterdam new amsterdam yeah Right. And so each of the different states had a different culture and a different right. thing. Uh, Pennsylvania, uh, the Quakers, uh, uh, the the governor at the time that the Constitution came about was a Quaker. And you know, I'll tell you what, the moral strictures of, of a virtually a theology in Pennsylvania was huge. OK, so yeah, this was an interesting in Massachusetts. This, that was one of the reasons why Articles of Confederation failed. Well, they, that's it's what they say that they they, they did failed. Not have, they, did they, not, they had individual states doing their individual things, but they didn't work as a cooperation very right, well. Right, but they, that was failing there were, there to was them. Thirteen different types of money, you know, and that if you didn't have that that cooperation, you were easy pickings for Britain and France and and whatever to come, you know. Pick well, you off. Franklin had said. If you remember that, you know, I, I don't remember the exact words, but if you want to, if you trade uh, freedom for safety, you don't deserve to be free or safe. It was something to that effect. Um, and that's essentially what people are doing. And in, in your example that you said earlier, you know, a lot of people, they, they have um, different priorities they just want to, uh, I just want my family to be safe. And they think that that's what's happening. They, they, their ignorance, um, they don't see that a lot of it, like with terrorism, for example, that they pass all these laws that take away a lot of freedoms, that the terrorist groups are created by the U.S. government in general. Now, they, there's a couple incidences that may have been actual incidences people getting shot but i mean your chances of of that happening is so slim that you know you have a better chance of being struck by lightning i mean people don't put things in perspective they don't look at things as you know uh in context and some of them just have different priorities there are people that would rather, hey, I, I don't care. I, I don't care about freedom. I just want to be protected. Some people may have that perspective. You're right. And, and it's, it's different, different types of thing. Along. But uh, anyway, uh, well, let's, I think we probably let's, hash that to death. So, yeah. Uh, so let's on that note, let's take a, a, a break. And when we come back, uh, let's talk a little about the CIA and, and what's going on there. Fault 7 from WikiLeaks. Lots and, of good stuff. Uh, yeah, a lot of stuff to uh, talk about there. So I got a couple of clips. Uh, some of them are, you know, government media, but I just want to play some um, a couple of those to show how ridiculous these fuckers are because they're talking about, you know, as I had mentioned to you off air, about 
putting the country, you know, are we less safe now? I mean, this is the bullshit propaganda. Hopefully people see it for what it is, but there's a lot of people that don't. So we'll be right back after this with Ken Shorjan of the Daily Economist and I guess the Ken Shorjan channel on YouTube. <laughs> is that what you call your... I know it says Ken Shorjan, so... Yeah, is that the Ken the Shorjan Economist channel? Pull it up. Yeah, I might as well use the brand, the Daily Economist. <laughs> all right. So we'll be right back with Ken uh, after this. Uh, nonpartisan Liberty for All. And check us out at nonpartisanlibertyforall.com. Well, another development that we're following today, and this is a big one, WikiLeaks has struck again, claiming that their latest document released today reveals important CIA hacking secrets. NBC News has not verified the authenticity of these documents, and a CIA spokesman is declining to comment. Retired four-star general and former CIA director Michael Hayden, also former head of the NSA, is a principal of the Chertoff Group now, and the author of Playing to the Edge, American Intelligence in the Age of Terror, now out in paperback. Well, General Hayden, it's great to see you. you. We could not have a more perfect guest today to talk about all of this. We are not going to go into the details of what WikiLeaks is revealing uh, out of caution and because we have not authenticated them. But just in general, let me ask you, how damaging is it? Well, uh, if they appear just, to be what they are, right. what about this continual leak, leakage uh, from WikiLeaks, this document dump? And this could be, could be, depending on uh, what... Uh, what assessment we make could be one of the most da dangerous and damaging of them all. No, you're, you're right, but but Andrea, I just know what I'm reading and reading very quickly and, and and frankly not a whole lot of detail. And I do reflect the agency's comment that they aren't going to talk about this and this has not been confirmed. But if it is what it pretends to be, it looks like a very extensive file of the tactics, techniques, procedures, targets, and political rules under which the Central Intelligence Agency conducts its computer network exploitation and other activities. So if it is that, it would be very, very damaging. And, and Andrew, I just got to offer an, an editorial comment Please, here. Sir. This is about foreign intelligence collection. It doesn't this doesn't invoke the privacy rights of Americans. And isn't it surprising that WikiLeaks, this transparency engine, seems to be focused on transparency only about the United States of America and its friends, not totalitarian regimes around the world? It certainly would indicate uh, something about their motives, indeed. Uh, now, let's move on to the president's tweet from Saturday, because it's still not substantiated in any regard. I wanted to share with you and all of our viewers and listeners what Lindsey Graham just was asked about uh, when were asked Rod Rosenstein about at the Judiciary Committee hearing on the nominee to be acting attorney, uh, rather deputy attorney general, because he was asking about what it would take to wiretap or eavesdrop uh, against uh, the president-elect or the nominee or Trump Tower. How could President Obama do this as alleged in a tweet by the president of the United States? This is how it went. You could have gotten a warrant through the normal criminal process. That would have been lawful if a judge granted it. Number two, you could have a FISA court, which is a little bit different, but it's still the court overseeing someone's request, right? Yes, that's correct. The third would be if the President Obama on his own decided to wiretap Trump Tower or the campaign, do you know of any basis that he would have the ability to do that without a FISA warrant or without a... Uh, warrant from a federal judge in a criminal investigation? No, I do not. Okay. As a matter of fact, he could not. No president can just unilaterally say, go wiretap that American citizen. So the, the man nominated to be deputy attorney general says that that's just not possible. Yeah. Uh, how do we understand, how do you explain, if you can, what the president of the United States was talking about? Well, let me first join consensus here, Andrea. That's just not possible. All right. And Senator Graham laid it out perfectly. In order to get a FISA warrant, it's either for foreign intelligence purposes or counterintelligence and law enforcement purposes. The president can't do it. In each case, a judge has to believe there's probable cause that we're talking about a crime or an agent of a foreign power. This lane over here, uh, foreign intelligence, was run by Jim Clapper. This lane over here 
law enforcement and counterintelligence was run by Jim Comey. And in the last 36 hours, Andrea, both Jims have said, not me. And so I just don't think there's any there there when it, when it comes to, to this claim that the president has put out. The president of the United States, President Obama, would have been breaking the law if he did it without going through either of those two paths. And he couldn't do it anyway. It would have to be someone from the FBI, someone from intelligence, from a, someone yeah. from the Justice Department. It wouldn't be up to the president. Well, let, let's, let's just assume a scenario here some, from some, you know, uh, late-night thriller that the president decides to break the law. I mean, he's not going to put the alligator clips on the wires himself. He's going to have to use an agency of the United States government. Now, now, this president is complaining about the bureaucracy being unresponsive to his guidance. Andrea, I can only imagine the response when the bureaucracy is told in this so-called thriller I'm creating here to go do this in clear violation of the FISA statutes. The American government's agents in FBI, NSA, CIA just wouldn't do that. Uh, from your long experience, uh, what is the damage to the U.S. abroad with our allies to have the president making these unsubstantiated uh, allegations, this one in particular perhaps the most egregious, but the others as well, Guantanamo today, to our foreign partners, to our intelligence partners who need to trust us and, and for whom, on whom we rely? for sharing intelligence, their intelligence. Yeah, let, let me just bring Mr. Putin on stage here just for a moment, Please. Andrea. His, his narrative is that we aren't what we pretend to be. We aren't this stable, mature, transparent, responsible democracy. And I fear an awful lot of tweets from the President of the United States reinforce the narrative that Mr. Putin would like the rest of the world to believe about us. I wanted to ask you about North Korea. Four more missile launches. Yeah. They haven't, as, we, as far as we know, the Joint Chiefs are saying that this latest one did not include, as they claim, an ICBM, a long-range missile that could reach the continental United States. But they are clearly advancing. Yeah. And uh, while they haven't figured out how to put a nuclear warhead on top of these missiles, that could be down the road. What do we do? Um, if there was an easy, what do we do, we would have done it. This is a genuinely wicked problem. I don't envy the Trump administration this issue because, frankly, Andrew, because of the limited successes of all of his predecessors, we're getting to crunch time. Probably within his first administration, the North Koreans will have a rudimentary, indigenously produced ICBM with a rudimentary, indigenously produced nuclear warhead probably capable of reaching the American Pacific Northwest. It won't, won't be a high-confidence weapon. They're going to have lots of problems with launch, separation, fusing, hardening, miniaturization, and so on. But then again, Andrew, if you're living in Seattle or Vancouver, what kind of odds you're comfortable with? This is really coming to a very, very difficult choice. And there's reporting from David Sanger and his colleagues, William Broad and others at the New York Times, that among the options being considered by this new administration are helping South Korea become nuclear armed. It's something that the president talked about during the campaign. Is that a good idea, to renuclearize the peninsula? It's, it's, it's an idea. I don't know if it's a good idea, but then again, Andrew, we're running out of good ideas. My sense is a threat, even a suggestion, that we would return our weapons to South Korea, that we would allow the South Koreans to develop their own weaponry, that's a carom shot. That's not meant to influence the North Koreans, because they probably have a negative effect on them. They'd want their weapons even more. What that's designed to do is to point out to the Chinese, if you don't put pressure on these guys, we're going to go do what we got to go do, and I don't think you're going to like it. And maybe then we get the, the Chinese to exert the kind of pressure that, to date, they've just refused to exert. And today, China threatened consequences uh, because of our <laughs> beginning to deploy the anti-missile defenses right. in South Korea, the so-called THAAD yep. program. Uh, how much do we need to worry about that? Uh, look, I, I'm fully in the lane of, with regard to the THAAD, this is we got to go do what we got to go do. Sorry, China, not meant for you. But as long as these crazy people up here keep doing this, we're going to take necessary measures. I'd, I'd put THAAD in Japan as well. And that certainly, Andrea, would get the Chinese attention. And finally, do we have a military option against North Korea 
uh, some sort of preemptive strike or any kind of other military option? You referenced David's really wonderful article, David Sanger, right. about what defense is doing. And they're talking about doing stuff left of launch. Uh, you know, do something to the North Koreans before the thing's on its way to, to North America. One left of launch activity is actually a preemptive strike. But, Andrea, like I said, no good options here. I, I've had two tours in Korea. My last one was in Seoul. When I stretched my legs, I would hit my chem gear and my Kevlar and my weapon. And my office in downtown Seoul was within range of thousands of tubes of North Korean artillery. Seoul's a city of 14 million people. And the last time I left uh, North Korea, uh, a couple of, just a couple of years ago when I left the DMZ and hit South Korea, all <laughs> that area that used to be mountain range right. is now populated. All it's city. now part of the suburbs of you Seoul. Bet. It's always great to see you. Thank you Thank again. You. Thanks, and of course, uh, the, the book is out in paperback. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe. You know, what I've just heard in the report and what I've quickly read in a few news reports, uh, the agency is not yet confirming or denying the authenticity. So I've got to put that out there. Now, if what I have read is true, then this seems to be an incredibly damaging leak in terms of the tactics, techniques, procedures, and tools that were used by the Central Intelligence Agency to conduct legitimate foreign intelligence. In other words, it's made my country and my country's friends less safe. What do you do about the issue of people inside the intelligence community? As Mark was saying there, there are 800,000 with top security Clearance here, 21,000 in the CIA alone. Someone, somewhere, got hold of these documents and decided to pass them on. How do you ever stop that happening? Yeah, that appears to be the story, Caddy. I don't, I don't want to jump to conclusions. Let's see how this plays out. There, there are other possibilities, but, but let's take that as our, our working, working hypothesis. And you've raised an incredibly difficult question. Uh, number one, just to sheer number, as Mark's pointed out, how, how do you make sure every one of them was and remains, which may be the problem from time to time, a, a loyal American or a loyal member of uh, British security services and so on? Beyond that, Caddy, there, there's, an, there, there's another dynamic at work here. In, in order to do this kind of stuff, we have to recruit from a certain demographic. And I, I don't mean to judge them at all, but this group of millennials and, and, and re related groups simply have different understandings of the words uh, loyalty, and secrecy, and transparency than certainly my generation did. And, and so we bring these folks into the agency, good Americans all, I can only assume, but again, culturally, they have different instincts than the people who made the decision to hire them. And we may be running into this different cultural approach that we saw with Chelsea Manning, with Edward Snowden, and now perhaps with a third actor. This appeared to be uh, very, very serious. Uh, but at this time, that's really all the information that I, that I have on it, uh, just to say that uh, we are extremely concerned and we are following it closely. Well, WikiLeaks out with a document dump, some 8,000 documents uh, that detail CIA efforts uh, to, to spy among the programs, according to the New York Times and others. We've seen some of these documents. Another program described in the documents is called Umbridge, is a voluminous library of cyber attack techniques that the CIA has collected from malware produced by other countries, including Russia. According to the WikiLeaks release, the large number of techniques allows the CIA to mask the origin of some of of its cyber attacks and confuse forensic investigators. Edward Snowden, who has been quiet lately, tweeted out today, what makes this look real? Program and office names such as uh, JOJ, IOC, Crypt Series are real. Only a cleared insider could know them. He goes on. Bottom line, the U.S. intelligence community is in an uproar tonight and looking for a leaker. Let's bring in our panel. Michael Needham is Chief Executive Officer at Heritage Action for America. A.B. Stoddard, Associate Editor at Real Clear Politics, and syndicated columnist Charles Krauthammer. You know, Michael, we have seen this before about WikiLeaks document dumps, but boy, this looks very detailed, and everything we're hearing from the intelligence community is it's, it's authentic. Yeah, I mean, it's scary. It may mean that we have another Edward Snowden inside our intelligence agencies, and, and that's something that should be 
very concerning to all Americans. It's not surprising that there's lots of intelligence programs out there that we don't uh, know about. That's a good thing. I think what's most concerning is that if WikiLeaks can get access to some of this information, what do the Russians know? What do the Chinese know? And what does that mean uh, for the, the effectiveness of some of these important programs? A.B., you saw Devin Nunes, the House Intelligence uh, Committee chair, not talk a lot about it. Uh, but also in here are ways that the CIA can make smart TVs and smartphones, uh, spy tools, uh, you know, cars, computerized cars have access to them. It's frightening, chilling stuff, uh, obviously the kind of technology that we want to spy on other countries, uh, but it sparks a debate every time there are revelations like this, um, even those that have been far less dramatic about what could happen here and what could happen to our own privacy in the country. It really is staggering how uh, much the Snowden revelations and these types of revelations set us back uh, in terms of revealing our sources and methods, set us back uh, with our adversaries and our work uh, in intelligence um, around the world. And it was so much, we lose 10, 15 years of work at a time, an incredible amount of resources. And Charles, obviously Trump supporters, their eyes uh, perked up when they saw the cloaking of hacks that could be blamed on Russia that were really internal um, and obviously people saying what does that all mean but bottom line uh, it's a serious breach look I can see how it can open up a hall of mirrors uh, about the cloaking and disguising the uh, the so-called attacks on the on our democratic system but the, the real story is I think that this is worse than Snowden it's one thing to disclose names and places and even operations but once you're describing the sources and methods, that's the key to what we do. And you've got to wonder, all the energy that we spend on the vetting of, I don't know, Yemeni nationals trying to get into the country, ought we not be spending a bit more of our time and effort on the vetting of contractors? Snowden was a contractor for NSA. Presumably this person who's leaking or persons were contractors for CIA. The, the, this, I think, is our greatest weakness. AB is right. We, we could have lost a decade of this. But I will uh, commend the CIA for one thing their creativity in code names. Umbridge is a beauty. <laughs> and we should point out that U.S. intelligence officials tell our own James Rosen that uh, they had a lot of very high tech uh, security measures uh, that they're trying to figure out how that was all breached at this moment uh, tonight. Let's take a listen to Sean Spicer answering a question about the president's uh, talk about wiretapping today. If he's sitting on this information that he found out, he's now directing or asking or recommending that the well, intelligence I, committees look right. into this. And you talked about they have resources and staff, which they do. Right. But why expend those resources and staff if the president found out this information and hasn't? I, I think there's a difference between directing uh, the Department of Justice, which may be involved in, a, in an ongoing investigation and asking Congress as a separate body uh, to, to look into something and add credibility to, to the look is adds, uh, adds an element that wouldn't necessarily be there if we were directing the Department of Justice, for example. Michael, your thoughts on this as we continue to kind of get the, the reverberations from the weekend tweets. Right. Well, the whole wiretapping story depends on what the truth is. And that's why I think it is prudent to have the investigation to get the facts out there. Obviously, if the relationship between the president and Russia is anything near what the left alleges, that would be horribly concerning. I think it seems somewhat fantastical. On the other hand, and I think part of the reason the president and so many others um, are getting as angry about this situation as they are is it is also extremely concerning if there is a constant drip, drip, drip out of the intelligence community of information used to undermine a president that they don't like, to undermine other uh, uh, not, you know, political leaders uh, that they don't like. Um, and that's not what America should be about. And so I think it's important for us to get the facts. The facts will tell us um, what's going on here and what's at fault. And that's why I think that, that some sort of investigation is important. Let's stipulate that, that perhaps the president, um, even though he tweeted it directly about President Obama, uh, was saying the Obama administration. Let's just stipulate that as, a, as for conversation. Here is Devin Nunes talking about uh, those tweets. 
president uh, is a neophyte to politics. He's been doing this a little over a year. And I think a lot of the things that uh, he says, uh, you guys uh, sometimes uh, take uh, literally. Uh, sometimes he doesn't have 27 lawyers and staff looking at what he does, uh, which is, I think, at times refreshing and at times can also uh, lead us to have to be sitting at a press conference like this answering questions that you guys are asking. But they are words, and words matter when they come from the Oval Office. You know, if they don't matter for the Commander-in-Chief, um, then I don't know uh, what will. It's Devin Nunes is a respected member. It must have been a tough day for him to tell the media that we shouldn't take the words of the leader of the free world literally. I mean, it's 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 just ridiculous. It's a reckless claim. The Republicans know it. Um, even if it was true, you don't make it on Twitter. You don't make accusations like that or observations like that. He could have talked to the FBI. He didn't. Where do you think this goes, Charles? I think it goes nowhere. I think this is chasing our tails. This is going down a rabbit hole. And if I were looking for something beyond anger to explain the president having tweeted this, anger at his staff, anger at the situation, it would be that this is a guy who has said all along, I don't attack, I counterattack. When he was a businessman and he was sued, what did he do? He would counter sue. You muddy it up, you end up in endless litigation, and then it disappears. I think he thinks, and it probably is true, this is going to end up as part of the Russian investigation. There is no evidence that any of this happened, the, the wiretap. On the other hand, there is no evidence yet that there was any attempt or collusion of the Trump campaign with the Russians. So we have a double investigation with no evidence. This, I think, we're going to look back on a year from now and think, what the hell were we doing? <laughs> Final thing, Lindsey Graham, one of the president during the campaign's biggest opponents, senator from South Carolina, was at the White House today, and he had lunch with the president, said, I had a great lunch meeting with President Trump today. He is strongly committed to rebuilding our military, which is music to my ears. President Trump is in deal-making mode, and I hope Congress is like-minded. How good was the meeting? I gave him my new cell phone number. Nonpartisan liberty for all, and we are back. On this Wednesday, March 8th, uh, International Woman's Day, or whatever the fuck it's called. And we are here with Ken Shorjan of The Daily Economist, dailyeconomist.com. Also, you can find Ken on YouTube. Uh, search for Ken Shorjan or The Daily Economist. You can also find his links in the uh, archive of the show after it... Uh, is created or in the show event on Facebook. So, uh, Ken, I don't know if you heard the clips there. Um, did not. Okay. Um, but yeah, it was, they went into two things. They talked a little about the tweet of the spying, uh, that Trump, uh, tweeted out, although he doesn't know how to spell tap. Um, he yes and no, but you're limited to 140 characters. So I know. I, I hate. I, I hate when they. You know, they <sighs> they refer to. Uh, you know, call them the leader of the free world, and they, I know they call the president of the United States the leader of the free world. I hate when they fucking say that. But anyway, and they they talked about the um, you know, the WikiLeaks documents, and they, as I was saying before the break. You have, of course, they talk to former heads of the CIA, so what the fuck are they going to say? But they're like, well, our country is less safe now, and we need to find people that are loyal. And I think, I don't know which who it was, uh, it might have been Comey, but one of, one of these fucking former heads of the CIA started talking about how, well, in my day, you know, you were loyal and all of this shit, and like... What, loyal what about the cia being uh loyal to the american people and they're not supposed to even operate within the united states unless 
there is a caveat to that. They're working with another agency, but obviously they're not. And so, you know, just shut the fuck up, really. So that gives you the right to um, fucking spy on people. I mean, basically they're doing what the NSA was, and I thought we knew all this shit already anyway. Uh, maybe Okay, I- Here, here's the scoop. Um, yeah, the, 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 the deep state, you know, from the election on has been on the run. This is why they've been, they've been trying their best. This is why Obama has set up white house 2.0, just blocks from the white house to try to infiltrate and bring down Trump. The deep state got wounded with the election, but they're not completely out. And here's the thing. Um, from what I've heard from people, I don't, I don't see that. Uh, Sorry. I I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I, I don't see that uh, being the case, um, and, and we'll, oh, yeah? ha- we'll have to wait and see. Uh, um, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what. When look, have you ever seen in your lifetime the media, your own political party? I think it's everybody an going I, against I, I one think single individual. I think it's all a fucking game. Well, I, I know. I think but it's all a game. But you're cynical on that because you think the government's just one big, uh, you know, fancy show. But well, I mean, I mean, so do you, look, for the most part. I mean, look, I'm a pragmatist. Okay, I am not. I am. I'm. I was for Trump more because I was anti-Hillary, and I was definitely not Bush, Jeb Bush. Okay, I don't have any great expectations that we're going to survive the economic financial collapse that's coming. So all this right. stuff that's that's coming is is sort of moot. But the fact of the matter is, this WikiLeaks dump. Well, I think there's more that's coming than that. This came from individuals inside the CIA itself. Right, right. And this is stuff that's been collected over a long period of time, from 2013, 2016. So this is this is not just somebody who walks in with a pen drive, click, you know, did a Snowden and was gone. Well, did, wait, been, wait, wait, hold on for a sec, just to clarify. Um, so that that's the date of the information, but could they have gone back and just retrieved information from that time or y- you're yes, 100% not- sure that they did it d- during that time? You know what I mean? Like, are you saying that that's the, the, the information ranges from what went on? What was it? March, 2013. Did you say? Right. To- here's, here's the, here's the thing. One, you couldn't get, just get, I, what WikiLeaks dumped? Is that, that's pages, what I was going to ask. Is, is that one percent? Right, right. So, so hold on. So, is that's what's been released so far? Right. Is the dates you're giving? So, yeah, and this, so ninety nine percent of it hasn't been released. So it could be other dates as well. Exactly. Okay. And that's the thing about it is, is look, you know, bureaucracy. Everything is compartmentalized. There's right, not just right. this one big database that you can stick a pen drive in and download everything. Okay. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that. I think there was more than one individual involved. I think uh, there are well, they there were, are those – you don't want to call them good guys in the sense that they're pro-American. They were saying but what it I was think a they hack, are, though, right? Well, c- continue. Sorry. Not necessarily a hack. Well, well um, is that – you have the clearance, then you have access to the information. No, no, no. But I'm saying uh, um, are we sure that it wasn't a hack from the outside? Uh, the, all the inferences that WikiLeaks has been given or been letting out, is it somebody from the inside? Okay. It could be a contractor. Okay. It might not be a, a inside right, but that, I mean, that's still, I, I still consider that, you know, kind of from the inside, but right. I, I'm saying Part as opposed to state. somebody that's, you know, sitting at their house that hacked the CIA, you know, right. um, now, now you're right in the sense that. A lot of the stuff we already knew, we already assumed, but this is just evidence that proves it. The key thing is, is some of the the things you can tie together. You know, I I, I talk about in my podcast today, and you listen to it, and then um, I wrote an article on it that a lot of the WikiLeaks revelations look like they come straight out of a Jason Bourne movie. Um, we have the fact that Frankfurt, the U.S. consulate in Frankfurt, Germany is a central hub for the CIA for all their cyber hacking in the Middle East, Africa, East Europe, and Europe. Uh, We have the um, Umbridge, which is the, or the, yeah, the Umbridge program, which they stole or got copies of all the different malware and hacks that are done by foreign agencies, 
whether it's Guccifer in, Hung- in uh, Romania, uh, the Russian Federation, Europe, etc. They have all those, and they know how to do cyber attacks using those malware so that it looks like foreign entities are doing it rather than the CIA. Right. Yeah, well, you also- that sort of throws that throws a Russian hacking uh, scenario completely out, doesn't right. it? Because if you remember when uh, the intelligence, uh, like um, Clapper, was put to the test and he said, did the Russians hack the elections? He said, we have no evidence that they did this. Why would all 16 agencies suddenly come out and do that? Well, they did it because if the CIA was doing the hack using Russian malware, they didn't want the public to investigate and know that they were uh, trying to do a false flag, blame another government for the yeah. fact that they were wiretapping Trump and, and American civilians on U.S. soil. And and, and you had uh, mentioned also um, the in the Born Ultimatum, which is co- of course my uh, series of movies there based on my life. Um, but they uh, killed a guy from the Guardian. And right. You had uh, meant- a journalist from the Guardian newspaper had stumbled upon the uh, secret programs, uh, right. Treadstone, Treadstone and Stone, Yeah. And now flashback down to 2013 when a Rolling Michael Stones reporter, Hastings. Michael Hastings, and what was Hastings doing at the time of his death? He was investigating, investigating the CIA. The CIA. And, and also, uh, the, even at the time I had said this, the CIA, I've, been, I've said it since it happened that the CIA killed him or the government killed him because even witnesses said his engine just like flew out of his car. Like there were witnesses to the accident and they had g- given a different story and your engine just doesn't uh, just, you know, all of a sudden just blow right out of your car. Yeah, um, it actually would have fallen it, straight down. It would not have blown straight up and yeah, out and, it, and whatever. Yeah, yeah. And, and there was the possibility they talked about maybe taking control of his car. I, I think they might have just put a bomb under it or something. You know, who, who knows? Uh, but pretty much to me, that's... Uh, uh, I look at that as a as a fact. I mean, there's enough information there. Now, that might be in there. I mean, I think of things like the Boston bombing. I mean, all these other documents that they have. Because you look at that. I mean, we we know, and, and the Boston bombing happened, and, and I'll just talk about this real quick. And, and I followed this very closely, so I, I, have, I have a lot of information about it, but... It happened before Snowden. It was a couple months before Snowden. So, and it was funny because one of the FBI guys they were interviewing were talking about, will they be able to go back and get that phone call from him to his wife to see if they could, you know, indict his wife. And he was saying, yeah, they can retrieve phone calls. And and they were asking how, and he wouldn't say how. But um, they said that they didn't know he went to Chechnya. Supposedly the CIA was tracking him. They didn't know because the way his name was spelled or something. And you're going to tell me that an agency that has all this technology, it's not like he got another passport and another name, which they'd be able to find anyway, just from his uh, probably by the picture um, scanning it or whatever. But, I mean, really, we're supposed to believe that? And, And that's just one thing. I mean, there's so many things with that. But, um, I mean, that could even be something that, you know, he was an asset of the CIA. Um, who knows what's in there? But Well, we, are, we already know that the CIA, CIA uses journalists and reporters as fronts to get into well, a well, lot of different things. It's, uh, it, this is declassified, um, I believe, that Anderson Cooper was uh, worked for the CIA as a— He was an intern, intern at the CIA. Yeah, he was an intern. Yeah. And— and also, I mean, you you mentioned Hollywood and the in the CIA, and it goes back even before the CIA. It goes to the FBI. Uh, in the twenties, they had an office in Hollywood, like right, right there. Um, and you had mentioned that uh, they approved the scripts based on you know using uh, Hollywood will ask you know can we use this or that whatever you know government uh, planes or bases or. And that they they'll uh, agree based on you know script approval. And, the and scripts we, have to go to the Pentagon, and the Pentagon exactly. has to approve it. Right, right. right. And, and and we look at all these movies, and there, everything seems to happen in a movie before it happens for real. It, and and even nine eleven, and there were a couple movies, but the one I always mention is the Long Kiss Goodnight. 
And I don't know if you remember that movie. It had Samuel L. Jackson and Gina Davis. And she was a, a CIA agent who lost her memory for like seven years. But the the whole th- point of the movie, why I think they wanted to kill her, to see if she remembered the fact that they were going to blow up a building and kill 3,000 people. And the senator who talked about it, I think he was a senator, said, we can't just, you know, do... He might have even mentioned the World Trade Center. You know, it wasn't enough. He said something about it not being enough people, um, that we need to kill enough people to make a big impact. So they were going to kill like 3,000 people, which is right around the amount that died in the World Trade Center. You know, something around there. So, and that was in, I think, 96. So it's funny how a lot of this shit, it's not funny that like that, but it... it you know, a lot of the stuff that happens in in movies, you know, ends up happening in uh, real life, and whether it's they get the idea from the movie or well, well actually, they don't versa, get the idea from the movie. Or... A lot, a lot of times, the uh, establishment uses the media, whether it's books. Think of all the dystopian prepare, type movies, yeah, to prepare them for yeah that have come yeah. out, uh, uh, yep. the Hunger Games, The Road. Uh, Terminator, I mean, you name it. They're all dystopian. And, and you know, the ones I mentioned were the fact that uh, there's even a couple um, lower-grade movies, but uh, they're about the government and the world being taken over by corporations. Tekken, Highlander 2, things like that. that. But I saw uh, there was one with uh, Christian Bale. Yeah. And that was pretty uh, good. And it was in the future where, you know, they wanted they peace. Got rid of emotions. Yeah, exactly. From yeah, uh, got rid of emotions. Yeah, yeah. From um, uh, medication. They gave them medication so nobody had emotions so they could have peace and everybody would be, you know, there'd Docile. be no more war. You know, right. shit like that. So, yeah, but, there's but a lot of those type of feelings, movies. You couldn't have feelings like you, you weren't allowed to have a pet because that instilled feelings. Right. You know, that type of thing. You, but. Here's the, here's the interesting thing when it gets to. Let's look at the economic uh, things of this. One of the biggest absolute uh, bombshells, of course, is that all these this uh, uh, zero day, that's what the CIA called their program, their entire weaponized hacking things. The ability that they already have backdoors into iPhones, yeah, uh, Android devices, uh, TVs. Microsoft. Yeah, TVs, Microsoft operating system, Windows operating systems. But here's the kicker. All those tools have now gone out to the world. Okay, they've lost they've lost control of them, and so here is the thing: not only do those uh, our nations and entrepreneurs going to be able to create uh, patches where they they, they don't they work can anymore, block it. but there is suddenly going to be this huge new industry for entrepreneurs yeah. who are able to do this to and they're create, going to offer exactly. it to people to, Hey, you want to patch your, uh, Android yeah. phone, keep, a keep the NSA and whatever out of it. Or to even create new, uh, compute, like, Hey, our computers, they don't have that access or our TVs right. don't have that access. Well, that, that's what they want to do. They, I mean, this is the whole plan and it's been for a while that they want all appliances to be connected to the internet for that sure. fucking reason that basically your whole house is like one big fucking spy unit that your washing machine. I mean, they have them now. Well, let me let me give you let me give you let me give you a little heads up. Um, you have you heard of Cliff High and the Webbots, the Webbot project? No. Okay, Cliff High used to. I mean, he's about seventy years old now. He's one of the most brilliant uh, programmers and coders going back to the '60s before they were even personal computers and mainframes and that. He yeah. uh, he worked with. Um, uh, Microsoft in the early days, uh, you know, all the government for different programs. In the early 1980s, he uh, decided to start coding as he saw the rise of the internet. Um, he started coding what is called uh, linguistic programming, realizing that many of the things that people write or put on the internet in their communications are emotionally based. I, I, you know, we talk about gold and silver and we talk about the freedom movement. And a lot of that is, a, is based on fear. Um, Y2K, you know, can you imagine how much uh, stuff was put on the Internet for Y2K? Oh, we got to run to the hills. We, you know, the whole world's ending, that type of thing. As And so he also, just the way Google uses spiders to go out and do, you know, to search for, to, for searches, 
he builds this linguistic program based on certain linguistic keywords to send out spiders to uh, get information and rise in the frequency of emotion in the communications. And he's got about an 85% dead on track record when he puts out his uh, monthly reports. The one thing he said today in an interview, uh, you, anybody can go out to Rogue Money on uh, on the YouTube and, and check it out, but he said that the NSA and the CIA were originally originally created. They have nothing to do with, or I should say, they have little to do at all with uh, covert operations and protecting the country. They were each created for a specific thing. And uh, so I'm well, going to pose a question. I never thought they had anything to do with protecting the country. Right. But I'm going to pose a the question. NSA. But go ahead. I'm going to pose a question to you. Since 9-11, since the Patriot Act, since the full-time surveillance, since all that, how many terrorist attacks have the FBI, the CIA, and the uh, NSA thwarted? That they claim? That Yeah, that they openly claim. They claim the to uh, because, well... They admitted. They admitted in a in a. I saw hearing. one. It, it was as of like five years ago, though. There, it was like twenty. Actually, in a Senate hearing, but... they claimed zero. They have halted zero. As a matter of fact, the only terror attacks that the FBI has stopped are ones where they found like angry men. Yeah, that's, and they what, sort I'm, of that's what I'm talking about. I was gonna, it. That's what I'm talking about. They there were right. like twenty. They created. Of they those... created the, the home terror. Yeah, yeah. But they, those but they little... haven't reported anything they didn't find the shoe bomber no no not find any the, of these uh, well the shoe bomber was a fucking setup there's so well, there's okay. so much evidence to that that it's not even funny well with that being said all of this surveillance all of this it's done uh, nothing of it, they did nothing so what does that tell you are they really interested no, in the, well, the I, king on so what that. is their real purpose the uh, according to cliff high and the, uh, who does the web bots he said the real purpose that the nsa was created was for corporations to data mine against other companies to get a leg up in profit making, in trade deals, in sovereign deals, and that type of thing. The NSA is really based on getting information. But it, and he from knows the that based on what? And the banks. I mean, that could be one. Uh, it's believable that that's one reason. But, but the I, reason the reason is is because most of the data that they collect, which they collect from everybody, right, is mostly interested in in the advertisements that they promote through google through all that yeah no i i wouldn't argue that that's uh that they do that i would say though that to me there's no doubt that they're also there to control it's it's about controlling the population as well. It's about uh, actually, you know. You know I, I mean, it's, it's not about of... controlling the population. It's about controlling the politicians. This is why you have, uh, the, you know, the leaks with the Trump. This is why you have uh, a lot of the uh, bl well, uh, yeah, yeah, but blackmail, black. Well, yeah, I was going to say that too, right, right. Yeah. But yeah, um, getting data on all the politicians so you can blackmail exactly. them to get to do. That's yeah, what it, and, and I would say that that that's there too. They, but what, they talk about you know they have access to turning on the mics and our our phones and all that. But you know what? They may do it, but the the it's, it's meaningless. They're not going to sit, sit there and waste I, on a guy like you and me. Right, right now it is no, but but right now I believe it is. I believe they're they're putting in the infrastructure, so they're collecting all the data. They're not looking at it because. It's just a waste of time. However, right. in the future, I believe when they have the capacity to do it, that uh, they'll have algorithms, and if it triggers a certain thing, they will. Because they, I mean, I still believe, in, and I know you kind of disagree with me to an extent, but that the goal of not just this government but all governments is more power and more control, and that's why. Oh sure, I that's mean that's why you can't have a government for globalism. This is because, why they talk about globalism. Right. So, so in and order, the populism is anti-globalism. Right. So you can do the same thing with people that you can do with politicians. Not only can you get them to stop doing something by blackmailing them because you have all this information on them. But you can put them in jail. You can, you know, whatever. You can Look, say they're they, a threat. The, they, so, I mean, I, I think it serves multiple purposes. I, I'm not saying that the information hasn't been used to harm 
certain individual like Michael Hastings or whatever. I'm not saying that, but for the vast majority, the thing about it is, is they learned in the 1960s, Kent State, et cetera. Jack boot thuggery only works in the very short term to instill fear and to drive people towards something. That's why they started using television and sex, drugs, and rock and roll as a much better way. Oh, yeah. People will love, they... you know, Brave New World. Brave New World uh, is about you loving your servitude. Exactly. Yeah, and I've said okay. I've, I've said this. So so um, the, let me just say this real quick. I I say this all the time that what the U.S. has done and what the U.S.'s goal is, in my opinion, is compared to say a dictator who comes out and uses basically force uh, blatantly, like right in front of you, and you know what he's doing, the U.S. did it in a way that they, one, they want to keep you comfortable enough where you're not going to rebel anyway, and at the same time, they want to convince people that they need the government, that they... It, there was a statement by somebody, and I totally forget who said it, but it was something. Oh, you know what? It, it was in a video that was done by um, Brett Vinat, and it was how, you know, eventually you, the government won't even have to attack people because other people will do it for them. Right. Meaning that well, if you speak out against the government, people will attack you for it, which I've been attacked look, look for. What, look, what, uh, look what Janet loving Napolitano your, tried to do. Loving your is, slave owner, loving your servitude, basically. Look, look at what Janet Napolitano tried to do in Obama's administration as the head of DHS. If you see something, say something. Turn in your neighbor. Right, and people, some people actually do that. Right. A lot of them do it. And, and so, uh, here, you know where that comes from? That comes from George Orwell's 1984 when uh you know they were they had winston in there and winston finally gave in and said you know what i can accept big brother and they said no that's not good enough yeah, you, you must love him love right big brother it, it, yeah exactly and that's what they're that's exactly what they're doing is that they don't want people to just deal with shit they actually want to convince people that all of this stuff is for their own good and believe it well, and sure, believe but, that they need and, all and this stuff. And you know what? And, and things like the welfare, the, the Great Society welfare system, um, the affirmative action, the division. Division, you know, that's that goes back to Mac, Machiavelli. Uh, dividing the people. So yeah, that they, they're that's all what they did with race. That, that's right. why Black Lives Matter is actually a communist front. I mean, that's exactly what they are. Go read their platform. I mean, exactly. that's exactly what they are, and they're a way to divide people. The way they covered the whole thing was supposed to be about all of a sudden you have, at the beginning, you had people of all races uniting against the police, you know, saying that the police are violating people's rights and we need to do something about it. Now, every time people talk about the police, it's turn, it's just about race. It turns into race, and no one's even talking about all the rights violations that take place, the power the police have, and all, all of that shit, it's, it's all about race now. They totally accomplished what they wanted to, and it's, it, it, it was all a orchestrated thing by, by the government and by government media. It really was, because there's not that the division that they show in the media, that doesn't exist in real life. It, it doesn't. I mean, they almost create. It almost does to an extent now because they created it. They, but it doesn't. It at least it didn't exist before that. They created some of it to a certain extent because people bought into it. But that type of racism now there is racism. I mean, let's be honest. But there's not. It's nothing like that. that you know what? There is it's, extremely little racism. There is individual prejudice. That's the problem is, is you know what, if... Well, that's not a problem like, as me, long as you don't ex- act on it. Let me give an it. example. Let me give you an example. When I was in the military in, uh, in Panama, okay, I was the only white guy on our base basketball team. And needless to say, I took a lot of ribbing, of course, you know, because I, I was the odd man out. Um, I, I put up with it, whatever. Um, but I, well, there was one guy, he was the coach of the team, and 
I, I was a starter. I was one of the best players out on the team. You know, I was young as in my twenties and he would always rib me to the point. And he was, he was a fat old guy who had had. Are you knee- talking about rib you like uh, elbow you in the ribs or. You- no, j- just rib me with verbal jabs. Oh, okay. Okay. And he just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. And it was more out of envy. Because you know what, he couldn't play like he used he to, and he wasn't as good as you. And at least I at this team, point you know? in his life, right? And you know what, over time, I put up with a lot of it. I put up a lot of it, but over time, it ended up that every time I saw him at work or on the thing, I hated him. I despised him, not because he was black. No, because of who? Because yeah, he that means done that exactly. Now, having that hate and prejudice against an individual. Well, that's not prejudice in the, against in an individual. 90s, Right. But in the 1990s, had I had I just blurted out, you know, just trying to hurt him and tear him down verbally because of my anger at him, if I had called him the N-word, back in the 90s, you know, there, not much would have been it. But because political correctness has gotten to the point that you're, you'd if be I called, called a, him that individually, right. I would be labeled you'd be a, called racist. a racist. Every black out there. OK, that's the problem. Well, that's the is, same thing with. Yeah. I mean, if you call somebody a fag simply- or you call somebody anything, because to be honest, there are people and I, I've talked about this before because I knew people like this, that they were, you know, white guys that got in a fight with a black dude who they didn't have anything against black people and they had black friends. They just didn't like that one dude that they had an issue with. And to fuck with him, you know, they'd go to that. But they, right. it would only be to push his buttons. It's but not see, like they were racist. You in, know what I mean? The, in in the uh, 1950s, when you had Sheriff Bull Connor and you had, you know, the people that wanted to keep the Jim Crow laws and and do that, that was well, that's racism. fucking racism. Okay, right. But over time, ever since the 60s, the new generation, especially the baby boomers, on forward. Okay, you may have some old hicks, or you may have somebody that really. Hey, you know, and the other thing about it is, is we as a people, as humans, tend to project onto others something that has absolutely nothing to do with them, but it's just we we need we we need to get our ire out, so we pick on somebody, we make a scapegoat. Okay, if we do not like illegal immigrants from whatever country, okay, that's not racism, because. Those who are here legally from the same cultural group were absolutely fine with. See, that's a big determination just because I don't want illegal Mexicans or Guatemalans or Hondurans to cross over here to steal jobs, to get welfare. To I would do say all it this, depends on the, the reasons. Okay. But if there are Hondurans and Jamaicans or whatever in, in New York City who are here legally and I run into them on the street, you know what? I have no qualms about it. My first thought when I see them on the street in New York is not going to be, are they an illegal alien? Okay. But if I see these protests where the illegals are out there trying to do whatever, I see, you know what, ICE, you have, just get a net. You can grab them all. They're all in one place. Okay. That has nothing to do with race. That has to do with a moral compass of following the rule of law. Well, I don't agree with the, uh, you know, um, illegal alien thing but i do agree with you if you say you know that doesn't mean you're racist but right. it, it depends on the the, the con- it today, depends it depends on the reason I, I think but for the but racist today is simply not agreeing with the stance well it, you know what it is i talked about this yesterday it, <laughs> it, sexist or misogynist it's a way or- no it's a way uh like i was listening to an interview and in, um the, where they called people that think uh 9-11 was an inside job crazy it's a way to not have to defend the argument you don't have to argue uh, if you call somebody racist you don't have to defend uh you know make an argument you can just say well you're a racist well that's not an argument or you're crazy well that's not you know, an argument it's like, let's take donald trump for example you know what donald trump because of the position he is in He's a he's a super rich guy, and he was surrounded by beautiful women, many of whom that we never see threw themselves at him. Okay, and many a times that he thought because he was You're rich, he could just up take what he guy, wanted. But right, that just being a chauvinist pig. Oh, that ta- are you talking about the tape? Different. 
Well, the 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 you, you know what's ironic, of course, is that tape was was. But is uh, that is that just to, I, to hold on for a sec? Just to clarify, you're talking about the tape where he was talking uh, off. Uh, can't, he was talking to somebody on the set of his show, and he said some stuff about women. Right, but that that's yeah. Part see, of, I I. I part, Hold on. That's part of it. I was going to say, it, I don't even have an, an issue with with that. Big, but, uh, that has That's two guys in a locker room. You know what? Right. Women, women and and I hate thing. Donald Trump, but I, I, I would get, I say the same thing. Now, I, I think, though, I never heard him say anything bad about black people. So I don't know why people are calling Let's him see, a racist that way. The reason but, they are is because they have no argument. Right. But they, they just what, he, he did make make. Uh, statements about Mexicans as far as you know committing crimes and and the way that he said it came off badly. I'm well, sorry. Sure. That, that's and, that's the thing that he said when that people speak from an emotional off the cuff. Some people just can't get the right thing out. You know, illegal alien or illegal aliens for the very most part are from a specific. They're from south of the border. And I'm not just talking Mexico. I'm talking Guatemala. I'm talking Honduras. Well, you try to make it like if, you, if, if you're whatever. Mexican, you're, you're a fucking criminal. And, and basically, you know, that argument to me is kind of ridiculous because just as many people in uh, this country, you know, commit crimes. And it's the crime you're talking about, too. If you're talking about right. a violent crime, that's, that's totally different because to me, drugs and shit like that, that's not a crime as far as and I'm see, concerned. Him, but, him, him saying that is no different. It's wrong in the context of the way somebody will call somebody a racist or a sexist or a bigot just because they can't they, they can't refute the argument. Well, the the only there's no difference, but it's both no wrong. right, right. But the the only the the only thing I'll say where people have a point is like I said about uh, Mexicans. But as far as him being uh, a misogynist and being racist against black people, he didn't never said anything about, <laughs> against black people. And you know what he said there. Women, a lot of women are worse than that. And that's when he was off camera. You know, he thought he was having a conversation with I, a guy. I mean, I personally don't talk like that. That's just well, me. Well, hold, hold but I, I don't fault them for what? Yeah, locker rooms. But here's here's the biggest irony, okay? He was in a trailer waiting to go do a cameo spot on, I think, Guiding Light or right, Days right. of Our Lives. He, he was on in, a set in somewhere. That, or in, some that, show. in that, uh, in that uh, filming, in the, that uh, soap opera, he, a woman came up to him and she threw herself even offering sexual favors if he would right. hire her. So the irony is, is that what they portrayed in that, uh, that film was exactly what he was almost referring to in a more derogatory way. Right. Um, in the, in the thing. So yeah, it's, I, I don't, it's I, too, it's, it's, it's two faced when the media cuts out the, the second part and only tries to show you in one light. Well, they, they try to, you know, the media has an agenda, I believe, of the government in general. But it's just like with the, you know, George Zimmerman, where they edited the fucking tape when they made it sound like, oh, this black guy. And they cut out the part where the guy asked, what's what's his race? Um, right, right. You know, same type of thing where or they try to say, you can present they something to say in a certain that the way. The guy was, was a white, but really he's Hispanic. Yeah, he was Hispanic. <laughs> I mean, and he looked, if if you saw uh, the picture, th these are a couple things about that. Um, if you've seen the picture of when it happened, I mean, he really looked Hispanic. Also, they showed Trayvon Martin as a 13 year old. My, my, my fiance thought a 13 year old got killed. Yeah. Because they kept showing that picture of him yep. at 13. He and, was and like they, six they, feet or six foot like one that, or they something. They tried to scour his uh, Facebook page from when he was holding guns and being a thug. They tried to scour that and get rid of it before real investigators started looking into it. So, I mean, basically the point being is that you can take any story and try to exploit it uh, for your own uh you know, political agenda, and that's what happens all the time. But um, on a, on, a, on a couple of quick side notes, uh, gold, silver, and Bitcoin. Um, Ron Paul was actually here in Arizona today. He was speaking before the uh, state, uh, the Senate Finance Committee, because there is an HB 2014 bill that would recognize 
gold and silver as legal tender. See, that, that's the difference, I think, between the other states where I said that there are states where there's no sales tax on gold, right. but it's not because it recognizes it as a legal tender. I think it's well, just yeah, there's because... No, there's no sales tax, but there's capital gains tax. Because gold and silver right now, according to the IRS and to state Yeah, IRS, but nobody's going to fucking know. It's considered a collector. Oh, yeah, nobody will know. That's, that's absolutely true. And this, except, except if you buy or sell in higher quantities than $10,000. Then the coin shops have to register it. Well, right, but you don't do that. You right. come yeah, back yeah. the next day, nope. with, <laughs> you know, but, or but more go to a different one. They'll give you. They have cash if you uh, buy three to five thousand dollars worth of gold. But if you have between like five and whatever, uh, usually they will issue a, a cashier's check, a bank check, and then yeah, they paid me in cash uh, when I sold. I think it was like a couple thousand dollars worth, but I I lost money on it anyway. By by the way, the web bots. One of the important things about the web bots. Um, it, I'm not going to make. I'm just going to make suggestions something along the lines of i've done i'm not going to advocate investing advice but the potential in the future of gold being really the store of wealth and significance is quickly fading uh bitcoin according to web bots may go as high as a million dollars of bitcoin if uh if what is web bots web that's the thing i was telling you about cliff high it's it's oh, a oh, algorithm, right, right, right. algorithm to to gar- get information you know uh, data mining um, the one thing that he uh, has said, and this is in particular, a um, million dollars for a fucking Bitcoin. I mean, that may be because of I mean, we've talked about this. Well, the other thing is, uh, yeah, well, that's a good reason. Yeah, it's but well, the the other the thing is that to the currency, it's not relation to anything else. Well, the, also that there's a finite amount that it will stop at. Uh, I forget what yes, the number is but but, it, but what they're going to do then is they're going to break it down into hundreds thousands uh billions whatever so what they're just going to keep well that's how they're going to do it they're going to fractionalize bitcoin yeah you but know? it's not going to increase the the amount no 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 it's not going to increase the amount uh it's just gonna it, it'd be like uh you just be able to you're talking about being I able to sell it and i'm going to break it into right right pennies. okay yeah and the but, but, are but, worth the the, the equivalent of whatever because as bitcoin um becomes more valuable and then products and services in relation to bitcoin say say uh, yeah you're not going to be able to buy years. with one i mean they do that now yeah. that you, like you, you, can... Ago, you can get pizza for 16 to 20 bitcoin well in the future you'll get a pizza for one ten thousandth of a bitcoin. right but even now they break it down because you have to because it, it was like you know when when it was 400 or two i don't know what it's at now but i mean you wouldn't use one bitcoin to to buy a lot of things you'd have to use like uh a fraction of a bitcoin anyway well, so they've the, been the other- do- they've been doing that yeah, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is uh, is at a crossroads, in my opinion. There's a how, lot. Of how much people. is it worth at this point? Uh, I think it's at eleven eighty eight. See, it went up. To it, it did. It went up to eleven eighty eight. Eleven eighty eight. When did when the fuck did that happen? I, I last time I because I haven't looked at it in so long. The last time I saw it, it was like four hundred dollars or something. Well, yeah, but what happened is uh, the Chinese were using it to to launder yuan into dollars. So. Once the Chinese people started getting into it, here's here's something else: the Bitcoin exchanges. Okay, uh, three Chinese Bitcoin exchanges did 65 million uh, transactions worth of Bitcoin in like a week period. 65 million. There's not that much Bitcoin there. What these exchanges do, and this is why Mt. Gox failed. Okay, is if you put your mo- if you put your Bitcoin in an exchange, they don't segregate it out and keep it here's your bitcoin here's your bitcoin here's your bitcoin they put it in a pool and thus they just keep selling and trading and selling in the pool unless somebody take actually takes their bitcoin out and puts in their bitcoin wallet okay if you've uploaded your bitcoin from exchange they put it in a pool well the problem is is it's a ponzi scheme and it works fine until People start demanding their Bitcoin. Right, they, it's like a bank wallet. that would. Fail, that's what ends up happening is that runs out of money. Right, exactly, and so that's what happened to Mt. Gox, 
It wasn't that Mount Gox. Um, I don't know why anybody. I'd always keep it in my. What did they get interest on it? I mean, what would well, no, be the if point? Wanna, if you want to sell your Bitcoin and get dollars, you have to go to an exchange to do it, like Coinbase or one of these right. others. Right? Did they not okay. have to pay a fee if they kept it in the exchange well, to yeah, change but it why to would dollars? You keep it in the exchange. That's the problem. Well, that's what I'm asking. Like, why would anybody keep it in an exchange? Because What's some the benefit? People don't see it as money. They see it as an investment. And they might buy the Bitcoin one, thinking they're going to hold it for a month, and then when the price goes up, they'll sell it. So they don't put it in their wallet. They just keep it in the exchange. Yeah, but so they, they can just move it when they sell, sell it. Sell it for whatever. Um, but that being aside, on Friday, the uh, SEC is now going to decide on the Bitcoin ETF that the Winklevoss twins, you know, the face, Facebook guys, they want to start a – a Bitcoin ETF on, like a, the, on the you're NYC. talking about like a bank electronic funds transfer. Well, it, it, no, it's like uh, the GLD for gold uh, ETF and the SLV for silver. What you're doing is you're buying shares that oh, are. Oh, yeah, I heard you Bitcoin. talk about this. Okay. okay. Yeah, and yeah, it's like, like the gold that they're selling that basically they uh, don't have is what well, you're talking about, it, right? Yeah, right. But you're buying paper thinking that you're buying right, Bitcoin. right. And for the very most people, you know, most people don't go out and buy physical gold and physical silver. If they want an old gold and silver, their their investment, their broker comes and says, hey, buy this ETF. Yeah, You're I would never gold. do that. The gold's there. And I, I want my gold. Delivered. Well, here's the problem. Once you financialize uh, Bitcoin in an ETF. It's an investment. It's not it, cash. Well, no, it right. opens up to manipulation. Then they can start selling derivatives on it. Then they can... Uh, naked yeah. short the thing then they could do this and guess what bitcoin price is no longer valid okay you financialize it the 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 real strength of bitcoin is its decentralization from from banks yeah because it's and not government it's and not once, like cash anymore right and once once the uh the wall street gets a hold of it and the sec starts regulating it then every single real reason to hold bitcoin goes out the window well didn't they rule that it's a currency or was it that it wasn't a currency no, didn't ruled, the court rule on this investment it, okay the so new, yeah new then uh, then what they're the doing district would court make... said it was a an investment not a currency and oh the one in florida in florida also because it, it not a currency okay could because that's the only way they could do it because if a court ruled it was a currency then they couldn't do that, right? Right. But what ends up happening, of course, is that you've got one segment of the economy that thinks that Bitcoin is money and they may trade through just Bitcoin exchanges when they want to buy it, or they may just, you know, trade amongst, you know, other people at Bitcoin, just, you know, uh, Bluetooth it over with their smartphones. You have that little segment. Then, of course, you have the segment uh, that thinks that they're buying uh, Bitcoin and they're going to buy you know, a hundred million Bitcoin in this ETF, which there's not a hundred million Bitcoin out there. So who actually owns it? And it's going to skew the price. Um, the others are, you're going to have, just like with the manipulation of silver, you're going to have Wall Street and the banks go in there and they're going to crush the ETF price so that they can buy Bitcoin, you know, force the, right. the price they're down. They're going to do the Bitcoin. same thing Gee, they did to gold. And it all. Exactly. And so once it's financialized, then the, the real value of what Bitcoin represents is gone. And that's that's really the, the fear that's coming on. Um, something else to think about with Bitcoin. They're only going to mine 21 million of it, correct? I, I forget the number. That's what I was saying earlier. I, I, to, I know there's to, a number, but... Up to date, they've mined approximately 16 million of that 21 million, and it's going to go on another like three decades before. Yeah, they mine. I know it slows down as it gets uh, as they mine more. It slows down how much right. is being mined. So, 16 million supposedly now, and 21 million max. I get a question for you. That's kind of low. Bit when Bitcoin first came out, how many people? Got some, you know, it was sort of a novelty, a fringe, you know, especially with the the um, uh, the freedom movement and all that. How many people got it and then forgot their passwords? Their hard drives crashed and died. I was gonna How bring many Bitcoin to, have been passwords. lost forever? What about the, you know, you have uh, Ross Ulbrich who has a whole bunch of Bitcoin somewhere that the uh, FBI can't get into. Yeah, exactly. 
how much of that is gone forever? So there's really not going to be 21 million Bitcoin. No. There might be take say we take away 10 to 15. Well, you have at one point forever. it was like a dollar or something a Bitcoin it, it, when it first uh, was produced. So I I mean you know who knows how many people bought it at that point and then you lost know, back in it or whatever. 2009 when people thought it was just a novelty or a right, fringe, right. there were people who would who would get together in the gaming community and they would say, hey, I'll tell you what, you guys give me about 600 Bitcoin and I will order a pizza delivered to your house. And they were like, oh, cool, I get a free pizza for this digital currency that, you know, is just fun. So people would start accumulating that way. You know, can you imagine in 2009 what we know now? Yeah, there's um, some... Th- buying there's... Bitcoin when it was order a piece there's people that are millionaires because of that off bitcoin that actually bought uh enough where you know um they bought it at 50 cents or something or a dollar and you know now they're millionaires there was a guy in the netherlands or in denmark or whatever he had uh in his bitcoin wallet he had seven thousand bitcoin back back in 2013 when it went to a thousand the first time and he, it would have been worth seven million dollars. He lost and forgot his password to his Bitcoin wallet. Crazy. And, and that, and that, there's no way to recover it. You're toast. And it's yeah. Gone. See, if I, if I had, um, right now, if I had bought a bunch of Bitcoin at like a dollar or something, and I could sell it and get seven million dollars, I, I, I don't give a fuck like how much it's going to go up. I'm, I'm not that fucking greedy. So I, I'm sorry. I would sell it right now. At the oh, eleven hundred or whatever, well, I would sell probably all but fifty or a hundred of it, and just keep that aside, and then you yeah, know, to the cash or whatever. Um, but that's that's going on. So um, let's see. There is also uh, a merger or a a, a co- cooperation between an Australian mining company and an American company that is using the blockchain. And in late March, they are going to bring out uh, a new cryptocurrency that will be backed by physical gold it's called Ozcoin gold see that's what i was always talking about that that was my issue with bitcoin i don't like things that aren't backed by something and yeah, what, what's the difference between bitcoin and the u.s dollar or euro nothing uh, but I, I mean well yeah but it, and, but i um, have to use the, the the dollar but that's why i, I bought gold you know, because I wanted gold. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's there's really not a difference except, like you're saying, you know, it's confidence because it's issued by the fucking U.S. government. And you have to use it. You can't buy stuff with – I mean, there's only so much you can buy with Bitcoin. But a cryptocurrency that's backed by gold, now, I don't know exactly how you do that. That's the whole thing. What they have is they, they are – for every new crypto, every currency, Oz, Ozcoin Gold, it's a ratio of one ounce to every 100 of these digital coins. And they're going to keep it, the, the gold stored in the Perth Mint. It's going to be open for um, like quarterly public audits. And in 2022, if you so choose, then you can actually transfer your Ozcoin for the physical gold so you yes, can have yeah, I, in 2022 you know and they it, put it, it out there that long because they allow the system to you know mitigate and to to get out there and to grow what what if we need is like tele- teleporting so like a machine that could like just teleport your gold coin to like someplace else yeah and um then we'd be all set but um, um we are we are heading towards march 15th and march 15th this will probably be the last thing we can talk about. March fifteenth uh, is going to be a red letter day. A lot of analysts are putting that on the massive radar. It is the day that the debt ceiling vote has to come about. Uh, whether we can print more money, if they're going to increase the debt ceiling know, again. It, this is every well, no, year. We haven't had a debt ceiling for for eighteen months. They completely oh, only eighteen it. months, and that's why. And that well, that's why Obama spent two trillion dollars last year in the budget. Well, you have uh, Trump's going to spend all this money on infrastructure, military. The military spending is the fucking biggest thing in the budget as it is. Well, There's by, thousands by, by of the way, bases. By the way, I know, but here's the thing: um, he wants the military spending primarily to get the military on his side against the deep state, 
the CIA, the FBI, all these leaks. Secondly, you military spend, military yeah. spending versus other infrastructure spending will create jobs quicker. It yeah, won't, government it, jobs. Hold on. No, contractor jobs. It's still okay? government You're jobs. you hire people at Boeing, at Lockheed it's, Martin, at those. It's the, yeah, because it, it's contract. They, wait, they're contracting out. So it's government. It, it's I the same thing. It's, not the most it's tax thing. money. It, I understand it's not the most feasible thing. But here's the thing with the, the $54 billion extra that's going into the defense thing. He is gutting the State Department. He is gutting foreign aid. That's going to be where a lot of the money's going Fine, from. do that too, but don't okay. fucking add it back to the military. Well, the thing you, is, you is know? we have no industry. It's gone. It it's doesn't gone matter. Forever. The, the, the we government... We rebuild infrastructure so that we have some type of industry. Look, the Chinese have gone seriously into debt, massively into debt, but and people laugh at their ghost cities. So have the U.S. <laughs> but... We spent the money on war. They spent the money on well, bringing in a modern. I didn't spend infrastructure. the money on anything. Uh, the okay. politicians but did. They, but they created a modern infrastructure system. They have nearly fiber optics going out even into the rice paddies. Okay. So if the global economy crashes and they have to bring a new system, um, if you've got no infrastructure, no industry, you're automatically third world country. Infrastructure, I can understand, something. even though it's, again, of course, you know, by threat of force, you're taking my money to build infrastructure. Uh, and, and you should have that money from gas taxes, which is still kind of by force, but not in the well, same yeah, way. But the problem is with but, gas taxes is that we've created so much inflation thanks to the Fed printing money by the tens of trillions. That's why the... The gas taxes aren't enough to pay for yeah, the but there, there's, highway uh, funds. There, there's no way. Never mind the infrastructure. That's one. I mean, f- fine. I, I, I'll give you that, even though I don't believe any you know people should be giving any money to the government. But to put more money into the military when it's as is, is like what? Five times as big as the next biggest military as far as spending is fucking ridiculous. I, I uh, this is not. There's I'm, thousands I'm of bases. Is, There's I'm fucking... suspecting that those are going to be closed. Okay, look at this. Look, Trump had to to close a military base. Trump can't. Where are they going to be? So they're going to be here in the U.S. So we have Wait, uh, on. military more. Uh, a you bigger military. Remember, a lot of things have to be done by the House and the Senate. When a, when a military base is closed, it's Congress who does it, not the president. He's got to be able to facilitate getting these people on board. Where most of his party, the the McCain's, the Lindsey Graham's, even the even the McConnells, that I didn't hear anything them, about him. Fighting. Yeah, I know, but I didn't hear him say anything about closing anything to do with military. Well, uh, everything he because, said about military. This is the mainstream media. OK, I have I'm not listening to, to mainstream media. I'm listening to him do, give his speeches and his rallies and all of those things. Yeah, But you have a limited amount of time and you can't get into the massive details. Not okay. really, because I can listen all day at work to whatever the fuck I want. So I've listened to a lot of these things. I mean, I can't focus on let, every let, little let, word see, because I'm working been in but, office two months. Let's give him a little bit of time and see what the outcome no, is. But what I'm saying is. He's he's talking about building up the military. Yes. So, and spending more money on the military. And and, and I'm gun, totally against that. And because I don't even think there should be a military period. How about that? But okay, I'm a pragmatist. I'm not being fine. ideological. But the, there should be, if you want a military, it should be cut by huge numbers. You know, you know where a lot of that money, by the way, is going. A lot of that money is not going to be building armaments and whatever. Right, I know. He said he's going to make deals to, you know, I'm going to buy these at less because I'm going to make yeah, this deal. No, no not that. Whatever. A lot of that money is going to go to the veterans, the VA. He's also saying. A lot of the money is going to the VA. Okay, but he's also saying that he's going to get more that. fucking nuclear weapons and shit, too. Well, the, the nuclear arsenal needs to be reconstituted. We got the stuff that's 20, 30 years old that's leaking. They haven't bothered to re- reconstitute them. So, um, but that aside, okay, you know, 
that, that's something we can obviously disagree and whatever. Um, oh, last thing I want to tell you, I don't know. Did you see that viral video about a house, a 400 square foot house that was built by a 3D printer in 24 hours? No, but that's that sounds great. A 3D printer. Um, it's a it's a company that's I think. Uh, how much? How much was the the 3D printer? Ten thousand one hundred. Well, no, the the total construction cost of the house was ten thousand. No, but I mean, dollars. like, how much was the printer? Like, how sophisticated is the print? You know, because you can buy like a thousand dollar 3D printer. I'm sure it wasn't that uh, one. This, this isn't something you can buy. Um, you you contract with the company. They coordinate the specs. They bring the they bring the 3D printer with the materials on site. And it's funny because. Uh, um, here, here's this. It, it looks like uh, one of those, um, I, you know, uh, eye bars or something, you know, or, or a crane. It looks like a little crane. It's got a big tub with this uh, uh, eco-friendly type of cement that it uses as the ink, and it sets down, and from the very platform, it starts just goes around and it paints the uh, the concrete. This, this cement type thing, and it just builds it up, builds it up, builds it up, builds it up, builds it up. The the only human intervention that needed to be done was to put in uh, the insulation, the windows, and uh, make sure the the outlet plugs. And the entire thing was built, 400 square foot house, manufactured, completed in 24 hours. The only thing it has about a bathroom. It has a room for uh, like uh, a washer and dryer and, so, and a little storage room. And then the other is just one big room where you have the bedroom, you have the living room, and you have a right. kitchen. Well, it, kitchen. I mean, what, what's going to happen is just like all other technology, and it'll probably take a while, I mean, 20 plus years at least, is at some point that technology will be affordable to you know, everybody. Um, it'll probably take longer than that. But the only thing that reminds me of – you know, the Agenda 21, now the Agenda 2030 shit of the put everybody in those little fucking houses and consolidate everybody into small areas so they can be easily watched and all of that shit. But as far as uh, being able to do things like that with a 3D printer, um, that's, yeah, you, that's you great. Didn't even, they didn't even have to prefab and bring the stuff over. They just brought the printer and it just built it in a day. Here's the other thing, okay? This is just a test, 400 square foot house. Over right. over time, of course, they're going to make it bigger. But or it's probably like what, what's considered a manufactured house. It probably, you know what I mean. You know those uh, like manufactured houses. Yeah, but it, this is made with with actually cement. It is this made is, with cement. Okay. Th- yeah, this is this is like uh, you know, think of a brick house. You know, the old red brick houses you have in the East Coast. Uh, think of a, but think of a. So they're cement. making bricks out of the 3D. Well, it's cement. Well, yeah, and it's I mean, eco, eco-friendly is. cement, and it's estimated that it'll last 175 years. That's nice. Um, but the point is, is that this test case is building a 400 square foot house. Over time, obviously, they're going to be able to make bigger ones. Right, right. Uh, the other side of the coin is, is you if you want, uh, you know, think about it this way: you get three of these little houses, interconnect them. So they're like rooms instead of houses. Um, the other side of the coin is you talked about Agenda 21. Yeah, that's something that uh, obviously the United Nations and the globalists want to enslave people through that. But how many people? You, you know that they, not to interrupt, but that they did a commercial with a bunch of celebrities for that uh, Agenda 2030. Well, it's uh, easy document. to get celebrities because they're all dumb I, I know, as I know, I know. But I'm saying like they're actually even making commercials about it. Yeah, all, you know all the all the the female actresses they they just die to become a UNESCO or a you, UN, UN spokeswoman. You, you know who was e and that uh, that uh, Hermione Granger from uh, Emma Watson. You know from you know that. who was the representative uh, from the United States at least on the 2050 original one of that document. Who's that? Uh, give you a clue. He likes uh, pizza. Podesta? Yeah. <laughs> well, here's the interesting thing, though. Okay. How much money does a city pay for shelters to deal with the homeless? Okay. We're talking probably 
10 to 30 million dollars a year and what if they could just build these little houses in a day in lots out there that would keep them off the street that would be relatively self-sufficient especially if the city ran its own uh, power grid and uh you know rather than have these shelters you just have these little things and people can come and go and boom 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 you know it's it's there's one thing you know the old slum lords like in New York those old buildings that uh that people were stuck in they won't leave because of rent control yeah you you have to really gut that thing and tear it down to actually make it in something modern because it's over 100 years old and it's well, uh, yeah, New York. cockroach infested and and I don't and see any buildings black like black that out black. here but here if you just need to build something $10,000 to build a 400 square foot house which you know feasibly for the homeless you could put in five or six little you know beds with a little kitchen in there for for the homeless ten thousand dollars you know you spend that much more per night for a for a homeless shelter what is it like sixty to a hundred dollars per person they put a thousand people in there yeah but again I'm, I'm not saying it's not a positive thing but i definitely see that leading to housing developments or projects with the 400 square foot uh, houses and the, you know, the, the Agenda 21 example. Yeah, Agenda 21, the, oh, they, they want to they build 100 story things where you only have like a 200 square foot little dome and they throw, you know, a million people into one of those little projects. Yeah, because, so they can watch <laughs> them and they can hey, uh, consolidate people. If you look people. down in South America, Latin America, like Brazil and, and Peru, they have those things. Well, they, they have they, them here. They have them in New York. Put a trailer on top of each other and call it a high rise. They they have um commercial not commercials, but they've had shows that uh, the designer actually you know shows the the little tiny fucking apartment, and they have them in San Francisco. They have them in New York. So they've already started. They're not three D printed, but they've already started um creating these things, especially in let places me, let me like New something. York. If if, if I so if expensive. I had if I had a little bit of land and it was the right place and that I would get those shipping containers about four of those and make a two story house. You know they cut those shipping containers they they de rust them they, they whatever and they are so easy for them to put all the infrastructure. Are you talking about like the big metal shipping yeah, containers the shipping that containers they, uh, they have the big boats? Yeah, yeah that that they can put they on have trucks tons and stuff and too. Tons and tons of those that are just sitting around and they are. They are making houses out of them. See, that's the thing about it is, is the the future is going to be some type of eco-friendly system. It's not a matter of completely sizing down, but the old way of doing houses is going to change. In the well, the, the point of sizing down is, again, so you can consolidate a whole bunch of people into one area so you can control them and watch them and all of that. And one of the ways they wanted to do that was – the carbon taxes because they wanted to make it so fucking expensive that you couldn't afford to live in a big uh and when i say big house i don't even mean big i mean you know you couldn't even live in like a 1500 square foot house unless you know you got a lot of money for your True. fucking electric bill but but think about it when you were in boston okay you know what it's expensive all those old, all those old houses there. All those old houses that were generational, you know, people lived in them for three or four generations. Yeah, whatever. and they're really those expensive. Those were barely 800 square foot houses, and they wrote, uh, raised families in them. It's not that no, they were no, forced into in there. They chose places. to lose, live there. Well, I lived in a uh, one duplex when I was there, and I lived in apartments. And the apartments I lived in were relatively new for Boston. I think they were built in, like, the 70s. But the uh, duplex I lived in for a couple years until i moved out and um i don't know how old that was but yeah but i mean that's a totally different scenario but yeah they they have it's everything's fucking old over there until the until the age of suburbia and then the mcmansions you know what the vast majority of families lived in 700 to 1100 square foot homes and they were absolutely fine with it yeah, I mean that's fine. I mean the townhouse choice, I lived in was time, like fourteen hundred yeah. square feet. I think where I'm at now, it's probably like sixteen hundred or something. I don't know. It's a three bedroom. Uh, it's a small house. Um, it's probably like sixteen hundred square feet or something. Oh, 
last thing I don't, don't want to forget, congrats on the uh, don't mention uh, don't mention that. I, I, I don't, uh, don't don't mention that on okay. the air. <laughs> Send me a message. Gotcha. Uh, so, all right. Well, again, you can find Ken at thedailyeconomist.com. dot com. You can also find him on YouTube at Ken Georgian, or just type in the Daily Economist. And he does his show Monday, Wednesday, and sometimes Friday. So you can actually catch it live. You don't do it at a set time, though. You usually do it in the morning. Right? Uh, usually it. between 8 and 10 Mountain Standard Time, which will soon be 8 to 10. Pacific time Pacific after, time uh, after Sunday. this weekend. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Well, thanks again for joining us. It's always a pleasure. And uh, go check uh, Ken out. He has a lot of informative uh, information, whether it's uh, if you like reading, go to his website and read some articles. If you like uh, rather listen to him uh, give you information because you're lazy and can't read. No, um, <laughs> go listen to the podcast or do both. Um, so uh, thanks again, as always, Ken. Yep. And, and you, I will talk to you in a few weeks, probably. All right. And Ken joins us every other Wednesday, so he should be with us uh, two weeks from today. And thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, I appreciate it, as always. And we will be back tomorrow to uh, do part two of our show on cops the show cops and uh continue the conversation there so thanks everybody have a good night listen to police officers commands listen to what we tell you and just stop the nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something do it and if you're wrong you're wrong if you're right then the courts will figure it out we don't get to take the but at the end of the day each and every man is going to